Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the eighth meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee for 2015. Could everyone please make sure that mobile phones or other electronic devices are silent or switched to airplane mode, please. Agenda item one is the first item of business, and it's a your say evidence session on personal independent payments, or as they're better known, PIP. The session will be split into two panels. The committee will first take evidence from individuals who have either directly experienced a PIP assessment or supported a family member through an assessment. In the second panel, the committee will hear from an advisor in the Orkney Citizens Advice Bureau. Uh, this will offer the committee the perspective from an island community and the particular challenges that this presents for PIP claimants. We welcome before us today uh, Mary McGregor, Moira Sinclair, Alison Arnott, who is supported by her father, Norman Gray, and Lindsay Souter. Uh, we have invited you here today to share your experiences of claiming PIP, and the committee will ask a range of questions. Um, we are keen to hear about any issues you faced, how easy it was to apply, anything that you think could be improved. However, if at any stage you feel uh, uncomfortable or you do not wish to answer a question, please just say so. Uh, we're not here to, to put you on the spot. We're only looking for advice and information. So just say no to the, the question uh, and we'll move on to, to the next one. So please don't feel uh, under any pressure to answer any question you feel uncomfortable answering. Now, I believe that each of you have prepared a written statement, so can I invite the person who has agreed to go first? Have you had a discussion? Okay, Norman, I'll come to you first then. The submission draws attention to the unsatisfactory way ATOS assessments are carried out. In the early days of your say, I was one of the first to appear before the Welfare Committee and made a submission to it over the consequences of welfare reforms on ATOS assessments. At the time, I was speaking about the consequences of my son being refused the points necessary for the PIP award, but can now speak of the actual experience my daughter has had during her assessment. Two years past September, she had an accident on the trampoline while attending her adult gymnastics class at the National Gymnastics Centre in, Fal in Falkirk. She was hospitalised for a short period, part of it spent on a spinal board and head restraints, and then released home to attend hospital as an outpatient. Six months later, it was found that she had suffered a double brain injury at the front and back of her head following her impact with the trampoline bed. Her injury has left her with a right-sided weakness in her arm and leg, some difficulties in managing herself and her household, but more importantly, an almost complete loss of short-term memory. These disabilities impinge directly on her ability to fulfil, fulfil her role as a physiotherapist, and after two workplace assessments, she was deemed unfit for work within the Greater Glasgow Health Board. With the assistance of the local Citizen Advice Bureau, she completed her PIP application and was then called for an assessment and interview. The outcome of this was the denial of her PIP award, so she sought the help of CAB again to appeal it. As part of this process, I submitted the attached letter of, of, of observation on her assessment. On inquiring of a rehabilitation team if they had been asked to submit a report, they indicated they had not but would ensure one was presented. She then received a letter stating the appeal was unsuccessful. My daughter then notified ATOS that she would be going to a tribunal. Today my daughter received a notification that ATOS had closed her case and granted her an award based on the change in the points awarded in the first few indicators. The award includes mobility at the high level. When my daughter asked the CAB about the fact that no cha change had occurred in the cognitive indicators, <coughs> They indicated that once the points threshold had been reached, there was no need to consult or consider others. The ATOS process has caused my daughter great stress and upset during the assessment and much anxiety and upset in the award stage. I feel it is a process not fit for its purpose and ought to be reviewed to make it much more client friendly. Going on into observations on the PIP assessment report, which I submitted as part of the appeal. I stated there that I, Norman Gray, along with my wife, Mrs Helen Gray, attended Mrs Arnott's assessment at her request due to her anxiety over facing an unknown person and being faced with questions. 
Since Mrs Arnott's accident and return from hospital, I have acted on her behalf in matters concerning meetings, reports, etc., because she no longer has the cognitive ability to do, do so as herself. My presence here means that Mrs Arnott has less anxiety and can respond to questions knowing that I will intervene or prompt her as necessary. Without the prompt, Mrs Arnott will look bemused for a short time, visibly become agitated by jiggling her legs and then ask, what do you mean? This happened one student assessment when she was asked to reply to the memory question. Mrs Gray has been Mrs Arnott's emotional support during these events, trying to keep her calm and in a fit state to answer the questions. When any questions relating to Mrs Arnott's accident arise, Mrs Arnott becomes very emotional and upset, as witnessed by her reaction when she was asked about her level of fitness. She burst into tears and said, I used to be so fit, but can't do anything now. Her presence at the assessment at Mrs Arnott's request runs counter to the impression given on page two of the report that Mrs Arnott does not experience a notable level of anxiety. The report dwells over much on the anxiety factor and fails to acknowledge the true impact of the physical and cognitive factors raised at the interview. All three factors combine in varying degrees at various times in our situation. I would wish to refute some of the comments on page two of the, the report as being contrary to the events at the assessment and as challenged to the detailed points awards. The first part was the report states that no significant cognitive impairment was found and you could give a full history. The history Mrs Arnott was asked to give was not a full history, but one dictated by a series of questions from the assessor. And these related to events that are deeply implanted in the brain due to the trauma she experienced. Mrs Arnott's cognitive issues were well demonstrated on the memory task. There, three objects were placed before her with other desk materials round about, relatively nearby, including an expenses envelope. When asked to, to tell the, the assessor what the objects were that had been, had been placed, she needed prompting by the assessor, then thought, thought for a time before giving answers which did not lead to the three items, but other items in the desk. Eventually, she did get all three. In reply to the question to repeat the verbal address she had been given, she would be mused, cast her eyes around the desk, and then gave the address printed on the expenses envelope on the table, which happened to be lying there. When asked to subtract 75 pence from the pound, she paused for a while, then asked, could you write it down, because that's the only way I can do it. When asked to subtract 3 from 20, she got it wrong at first, then got it right by counting down on her fingers. These events negate the claim that there was no significant impairment found at assessment, and run contrary to the indicator scores for reading and understanding, communicating verbally, and by inference, making budgeted decisions. The next point was, you are not on a high dose of medication for anxiety. I fail to see where the, con the conclusion came from. While the assessor verified which medication Mrs Arnott was taking, he did not ascertain which, what each one was promoted to prescribe for. I know for a fact that no report was sought from Mrs Arnott's headway team and Mrs Arnott's GP has not given her an indication of being asked for one. The next point was with regard to taking the children to school. The report overemphasises the role of anxiety in making a decision. At the assessment, Mrs Arnott indicated there were a number of factors such as her physical condition and her cognitive disabilities which made driving stressful for her and created anxiety over the welfare of her children. However, she could see no alternative to doing this task herself. The next indicator was planning and following journeys. During the assessment, Mrs Arnott stated she can drive within the confines of Denny and through to Falkirk only because she had been shown the way and has done it, now done it often enough for it to be implanted. She indicated that she was not capable of planning and following an unknown route. I would contend that the assessment and, and score allocated to this indicator is the erroneous and not based on Mrs Arnott's evidence. There are other aspects of the report that I would take issue with, 
but these do not stem from evidence presented at the assessment interview. That's my submission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. Um, I don't know if you've agreed an order. I'll just come to whoever you have spoken next. Okay. But carry on. Thank you. Well, I uh, welcome the chance to share my views and experience of the move from DLA to PIP. I have to say I haven't yet moved to PIP. I'm awaiting uh, word of when I'll be reassessed for that. Um, what you'll hear from me is it may seem odd that I focus on transport and mobility, but as I hope I'll make clear, um, I think that's where I will feel the issues certainly most keenly. Uh, I'm lucky. I've uh, currently got an indefinite award of DLA at the higher rate for mobility, and it'll be next year before I'm reassessed for PIP, I think. I'm already terrified of what that might mean. I'm disabled. I'm very lucky. There are many in a worse position than I am. I've been disabled for to differing degrees since childhood. I had my first surgery uh, at age 11. I've undergone numerous surgeries, I had pins and plates in my hips and pelvis, hip replacements, and I'll be due for another set of them at some point very soon. Uh, I've had disc removed from my back, and uh, partly that leads to osteoarthritis throughout my body, head to toe, uh, back, ne hips, neck, shoulders, ankles, hands, it's everywhere. And obviously you take a lot of medication and things for all of that too. My condition is variable. I have a, a normal underlying level of pain, which is there every day, um, up to where, if it's particularly bad, I can be just completely incapacitated and unable to get out of bed with back spasms. It's also affected by activity. If I force myself to do something, the likelihood is that I will pay for it soon after. And uh, that increases pain and uh, a seizing up of all the joints. I do, however, try to live as normal a life as possible. Um, I work full time, and I have for most of my life since leaving university. My family and friends help me complete daily tasks and to live as full a life uh, as I can. I start the day early. I take my painkillers, wait for them to kick in before I start the slow process of washing, for which I have a seat uh, in my bath and dressing, which can take a while. But I build that in to what I do every day in my life. It can take me up to three hours to be ready to leave the house. And I deal with that every day before I go to work. But I do it and I go to work. Sometimes uh, on a bad day I can't drive because of the pain. So I'm very lucky that my father's able to drive me. And yes, I'll get him to drive me to work rather than take the day off. I'm usually in pain to a greater or lesser degree, but it would be awful to let that stop me doing anything. So what do I think the changes would mean for me? Well, my first thought was on what I understood the purpose of DLA to be. It was my understanding that it was a payment meant to offset the increased costs that I would incur because I am disabled, a way to level the playing field. These costs could be the fact that I pay someone to do my ironing for me, the fact that I seem to damage shoes quickly because of the way I walk and trip, the fact that I can't walk any useful distance and will incur higher transport costs and things. This is the focus of my payment as I receive the higher rate for mobility, but nothing for the care component. I choose to use my allowance to fund a car under the Motability Scheme. Because of my disability, I need a car with a high seating position and I feel that as I drive a lot, especially to get to work and on holidays in the Highlands and Islands, which is easier than trying to negotiate airports and make arrangements for overseas, that I can justify a four-wheel drive vehicle. After all, when it snows, I can't leave the car and walk away. The DLA, of course, only covers the cost of a standard car. Working allows me to pay the advance payments required to get the car I want. Over the years, I've paid thousands of pounds to lease the cars I have wanted. It's disappointing that some seem to believe that I am given this car, 
and dis disappointing that such reactions appear to be behind a crackdown and decision to reduce the payments of DLA. Would it be more acceptable if we went back to the days when I would be given an invalid carriage which wouldn't suit my needs as an individual? <laughs> My award of DLA at the higher rate for mobility is also a passport. It gets me my blue badge. I have an allocated disabled space in the car park beside my house and I do not receive any other benefits, financial or otherwise. The blue badge and the disabled space are invaluable in allowing me to live a normal life. There is allocated blue badge parking at my workplace and I can therefore continue to work and contribute to society, paying my taxes, etc., which in turn pay for my DLA. I believe there's a net benefit to society, government funds and my working, as opposed to my not working and claiming unemployment benefits. Rough calculations will show that the net gain to the state of my working is around £5,000 per annum, as I will detail at the end. Why am I scared by the introduction of PIP? The qualifying, qualifying criteria have changed, and despite the years of clear evidence, because I don't know how I could have faked the x-rays, and I'm sure the surgeons weren't operating for fun, I fear that I will no longer be considered eligible. Yes, I can walk a bit on most days, and sometimes further than the new limit, but that 20 metres is a pointless distance. What am I supposed to be able to achieve by walking that distance. On some days, every step is agony, but I keep going and I walk the distances I have to between my house and my car, my car and my workplace. I can do a bit around the supermarket, although I can't go shopping as some do as a leisure activity. I can get around a shop and that's enough and I'll pay for it in pain later. Even then, my elderly father carries the shopping for me. Is the fact that I can usually, though in pain, walk 20 metres supposed to somehow indicate that I can live normally, walking the same distances as non-disabled people? My fear is informed by the fight I had to be awarded DLA in the first place. I was turned down, I appealed, I was awarded it for a year. I reapplied, was turned down, I appealed, it was awarded for a year. I reapplied, I was turned down, I appealed, it was awarded for three years and it was eventually awarded as an indefinite award. So here I go again. Am I on the same cycle? Yes, some medical conditions will improve. However, I'm unlikely to grow a new skeleton. Why can't those of us with indefinite awards and conditions which will not improve just be transferred over to the equivalent PIP status? A lot of time, effort and money will be spent assessing people, it is perfectly obvious, will always be entitled to PIP. It almost seems that I would be better giving up. If I, should I decide that I can't handle any of the pain, sit in a wheelchair, doped up with painkillers for the rest of my life? Well, that doesn't seem sensible. I would have the added access hassle that that would bring, and my health would suffer. Society would lose the product of my work and taxes. Surely it is better that I do as much as I possibly can, weighing up for myself the costs and benefits on good and bad days of what I can do. Yes, one good day, I might walk further to take my nephew somewhere, and then I'll spend a few days in utter agony. But surely it's better that, that than deciding I can never do anything. Even then, I can only achieve these small things because of my motability car and my blue badge. So what would life be like without my DLA or PIP, without my motability car, my blue badge? Be awful. I would no longer be able to work. Public transport from my house to work would be almost impossible. Even the walk to or from the bus stop is likely to be too far. And if I stand and wait, I might not then be able to board the bus. Standing is worse than walking. Not to mention the timing issues, which would be an even earlier start in the morning. Without my car and the allocated parking space, I'd be almost housebound. It would mean relying on taxis, but how do I pay for them without the DLA or working and the kindness of others? I would lose my independence, and I am fiercely independent. I'm single, with no children. Who am I supposed to rely on? Yes, I could work and pay for a private car, although it's unlikely to be as suitable. But if I can't park near enough to my house or my work, what am I supposed to do? 
Should I say goodbye to socialising if I can't get close enough to the venue? Should I never do my own shopping if the walk from the car park is more than I can manage? So, I am terrified. I can't see how my life can continue as it is if I lose my DLA at the higher rate for mobility. Do I think about whether life would be worth it? Honestly, yes. I have contemplated ending things if I don't receive PIP and not at the rate to allow me to continue to have my motability car and blue badge. For me, it is all or nothing. I do not qualify for any care payment. I also fear that those making decisions confuse the fit to work tests with the PIP assessment. Yes, I'm clearly able to work and I have worked for most of my adult life. That doesn't mean I'm not disabled and do not incur additional costs because of that disability or do not need some special arrangements to allow me to live my life. I'm also gravely concerned about the many others in the same situation, terrified of losing their benefits, losing hope when they are refused PIP. I fear that there will be an increase in extreme poverty amongst the disabled. But don't worry, you won't see it. They'll all be stuck indoors. And I fear there will be an increase in suicide amongst the disabled. I'm lucky. I'm literate. I'm able to understand the forms and questions. There are others who will this will just happen to, who will be too nervous to complain or make a fuss, who will accept the decision of the state must be correct. As an experiment, get a pedometer or similar, stand at your front door and walk 20 metres. Is that enough to get you where you need to be? Park is normal at the supermarket. Walk 20 metres. Have you even reached the door yet? Does the fact that someone can struggle and walk 20 metres mean that they do not have a mobility disability? I think not. Surely, in fact, it's actually easier for someone in a wheelchair to go further than someone who walks but in pain. I am one of the hard-working majority, and yet I'm made to feel like some terrible scrounger or that I am claiming something under false pretenses. The stress is awful. Trust me, I'd rather not be in pain and not claim DLA or PIP. I live as well as I can and over the years have found various ways of making things easier. To gauge how much pain something is likely to cause, no one else will realistically be able to measure the pain I feel, the compromises <coughs> I make or the decisions I take. But the evidence that I am disabled is clear in my medical records. So what should I do? Continue as I am? planning and deciding based on my knowledge and experience, keep working and contributing, or give up, stop work, be in a wheelchair before the PIP assessment comes along. I know what I want to do, I know what I think is best for myself and society, but, but PIP reassessment makes it seem better to go the other way. Unfortunately, one day I may well be wheelchair bound and even less able than I am today. I'd rather put that day off as long as I can. I've calculated what it would cost the state if I do not receive PIP and have to give up work. If I keep getting DLA or PIP and working, so paying my tax and national insurance, there's a net gain to the state and the taxpayer of around £5,000 per annum because I pay around £7,800 in tax and national insurance. The DLA is just under £3,000 for the year. If I lose the DLA PIP and have to give up work, there's a net loss of around Eleven and a half thousand per annum, which is significant if I'm going to work for another twenty odd years, and that comes from the loss of the approximate tax national insurance of around seven thousand eight hundred, and the payment to me of the income support, which would be at least the three thousand seven six five, which would be the basic level. If I couldn't work because of access issues, etc., because of DLA, so the loss of my blue badge, the loss of the car then I would presumably receive at least £72.40 per week in benefit, which is more than the cost of providing me with DLA and allowing me to contribute to society. Even looking at it as just swapping DLA for income support, ignoring the tax and national insurance, it's a loss to the state or taxpayer of around £800 per annum. And I've given some details there. So the net gain to state is around £5,000 per annum. Obviously, I understand that that also pays for the NHS, etc. But being able to walk 20 metres is not sufficient criteria to say I'm not disabled and not entitled. 
and I hope this review helps you in your deliberations and somehow something can be done. Thank you. Thanks very much, Moira. I think we're going to Lindsay next. Thank you. So my name's Lindsay Souter and last June my husband had a stroke. His recovery has been slow and we've had quite a few setbacks. In December 2014, we started the PIP application process. We complete, completed and submitted the form and we had help and support from the Grapevine Disability Information Service in Edinburgh. My husband was originally sent a letter asking him to attend a face-to-face -face assessment for PIP in Dunfermline. We actually live on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Um, in the PIP notes, it does explain that no one will be expected to travel more than 90 minutes from a claimant's home to an assessment centre. When we looked into this, we found that it would have taken us around two and a half hours to get from our house to the assessment centre, and that would have been two buses and a train. My husband struggles to use public transport and in the past had to get off buses due to there being too much noise, too many multiple inputs causes them to be overloaded and coupled with, again coupled with this um, his vulnerability and um, if he's in an unfam unfamiliar town or setting he's very anxious. When I asked if the appointment given could be rearranged to a more convenient location um, they wouldn't accept my authority to change this and they, they requested that my husband had to be present to confirm this uh, agreement and call them back. I complained to Atos about this because I was really complaining that they'd not followed their own rules. Um, they said I couldn't complain, um, so I then phoned the DWP back and complained directly to them. After that, an Atos official got back in touch with me, offered me an appointment two days before the original appointment and at Argyle House in Edinburgh. So we made it to the PIP face-to-face -face assessment. We had to park away from the building. My <coughs> husband didn't want to be dropped off while I parked the car because, as I've said, he struggles to deal with new surroundings and people that he doesn't know. So we waited and we were taken into the room by the assessor. I felt that the assessor purposely seated me behind the computer screen monitor so she could not see me and my husband was seated at the other side of me, at the other side of the <coughs> room. Now, a consequence of stroke can be a loss of peripheral vision, so seating the carer of a stroke patient in the peripheral field of vision shows real unawareness. The examination took about 20 minutes in total. My husband was asked a series of questions, and she typed during the duration of the appointment. I was expecting the form, the form that we'd filled in, that had taken hours to fill in, to be the basis of the examination. It wasn't mentioned. At no time was I asked for any particular feedback, despite my husband being very nervous. He's also affected by a stammer, which impacts on his verbal communication when he's in unfamiliar situations. Again, information in the form not, not referred to. Some of the questions my husband was asked were not reflective of his ability to manage certain tasks. For example, managing budgeting decisions. He was asked to ex um, subtract seven from 100 and then carry on. He did this very slowly. I've actually discussed these tests that were carried out and I've been told by mental health professionals and my husband's stroke consultant that a mini mental state test is not a valid way to assess cognitive impairment after stroke. Equally, working out the change from £5 does not equate with complex financial decisions or transactions. I have had to renegotiate our home and contents insurance after our insurers withdrew cover, <coughs> deal with the life insurance provider. Move utilities for a better deal, and I'm dealing with our mortgage lender at the moment. My husband cannot deal with this. When a decision letter was received, my husband was awarded no points for any activity. The assessor described that this was consistent with our description of a typical day. Informal observation at your consultation and the findings of your mental state examination. 
At no point during the PIP face-to-face -face assessment was the reliability criteria referred to, which are explicitly set out in the PIP regulations. According to the Social Security Personal Independence Payment Amendment Regulations 2013, activities must be able to be carried out safely to an acceptable standard repeatedly and within a reasonable time period. We do not feel that these criteria were used to assess any activity. We are now requesting a mandatory reconsideration detailing the specific details of my husband's impairment and how this affects and impacts on his ability to carry out daily living and mobility activities. The letter was submitted on the 17th of March, only logged on the DWP mail system as of 30th of March. As of today, I've had nothing from them. The whole process has been extremely upsetting for us. We now face longer delays with the payment of a benefit, which is there to provide a safety net. We actually feel like we're begging for this payment. We've paid for this insurance and just want it to be treated fairly by the system. I trusted the system. I didn't make a fuss at the assessment. I trusted we would be awarded what we were entitled to. My husband is not working because of the effects of stroke, and this has affected him on so many levels. I'm the main breadwinner, and I've had to take a lot of time off for appointments, using annual leave to deal with all these matters. I'm very glad of the support of third sector charities like the Grapevine Service. Thanks very much, Lindsay. And finally, Mary. I found the form didn't give us much opportunity to make a case as I would have liked. There were only a few lines to answer each question, which do not allow for someone having multiple issues with the same task. Having seen the scoring system, it appears they only allocate one set of points for each section. So for chronic illnesses like ME, which I have, where there's a little wrong in a lot of functions, the cumulative effect is missed and the applicant may lose out on benefit they need compared to someone who has a single clear-cut impairment. The process of completing the form is draining and the time allocated does not allow for it to be spread out. I had some of the information needed in an online diary I'd been using for therapeutic purposes, but I still needed to ask for an extension. I ended up printing pages to stick into the form as this was easier than writing it out. Having been denied DLA twice, I went into a lot of detail in the form and hoped that I would be spared a further physical assessment, having had an ESA and DLA medical in October 2012 and a DLA tribunal in January 2013. And having gather, gathered as much written evidence as I could to include with the application. I applied in August 2013 and did not hear anything for months. I eventually called the DWP in the spring who advised the application was with Atos. I called them and was told, it will be soon, you will, you've been waiting a long time. There was no qualification of how soon soon meant. I got a letter advising of an appointment to have a face-to-face -face assessment on April 28, 2014. The appointment was un in Dundee, despite me having made a request to be seen in Perth due to additional fatigue and pain travelling would cause. This request was not even acknowledged, never mind granted. By this point I let it slide and asked a friend to drive me to the appointment to avoid further delay in getting a decision. Having been turned down for DLA twice and my income having reduced, I've been barely scraping by, mostly ignoring things that might help me due to the expense. The assessment itself seemed to duplicate a lot of what was in the form. The assessor was pleasant and courteous enough, and he had a trainee with him who was also pleasant. The process was explained clearly at the outset. The structure of the interview seemed to be unnecessarily repetitive first naming each diagnosis, then medications for each diagnosis, then symptoms of each condition, then a typical day. All of this information was in the form and I found that I was repeating things from one section to the next and having to get the assessor to go back and add information to previous sessions. For people like me with more than one diagnosis and lots of symptoms arising from ME, 
This was a long-winded process. I was conscious of the assessor trying to move through the list of questions and as the interview went on, I got more fatigued and found it hard to keep up. I felt I'd forgotten to put forward a lot of things that might have been helpful. I think the physical assessment might have been cut short due to the time the other parts had taken. By this point, I was exhausted. The assessor kept telling me not to push myself, but it's difficult not to when you rely on pushing yourself to get through life, and I was in pain before I started. I hope this will be taken into account. The assessor appeared to be writing what I was telling him and didn't make the mistake of an EMP in my previous DLA application where I was given lots of advice in inverted commas and the report was more of what he had told me than what I had told him. The physical assessment was largely the same in both cases and for a complex condition like ME doesn't seem to provide the opportunity to evidence the symptoms enough to justify the energy expended. I was advised I should have had an answer in six to seven weeks and to contact the DWP after four to five to make sure they hadn't lost the form. Very confidence inspiring. I then received a letter from Atos advising my assessment had been chosen for audit, which usually took a few days, and I got a letter after confirming the audit had been completed. It would have been helpful to have updates on the progress of the application. With my DLA applications, I received letters apologising for not having made a decision within the target time. But with PIP, it appears that unless you phone and pester, you don't get any information. It's not every day I feel I have the energy or the brain power to make a chase-up call. I feel it's wrong to keep somebody in poverty because of disability. And when it's the best part of a year stuck in a backlog with no information, it's difficult to feel positive about the support available. Even a backdated payment does not make up for months of having to make do to the detriment of your health. It does not seem to be too much to ask for them to get it done in time and get it right first time, <coughs> but apparently it is. I got my decision a year after I applied and I'd only been given four <coughs> points for mobility, not enough for an award. There was little explanation of how they reached the scores, just she can do X, Y, Z unaided. I requested further information and was told I could have a phone call, but no further written explanation. The report stated I had attended the assessment alone, having driven myself there, which was not only incorrect, but further assumptions were made on the basis of this. It was stated that as I could drive, I could do other activities, for example, cooking or showering. I had stated I could only drive short distances and that this exhausted me and that I only drove because I couldn't walk far. I made the mistake of trying to apply for a reconsideration myself. The friend who had attended the medical with me was unwell and I asked for help at various stages from other friends at work but did not give anyone else full responsibility. I ran out of time and on the advice of a colleague telephoned to note my intention to apply for a reconsideration and further information would follow. I specifically asked if there was a deadline and I was told there was not. I'd been given training handouts on appeals and was advised to point out the evidence for each descriptor. Since ME symptoms meant a lot of the points were scored on the reliability tests, I could maybe do the activity once but not repeat it or it would take me far too long, uh, for example. This meant describing these for each descriptor too. A friend at Mindspace Recovery College help, arranged help from my MP's office. They got a copy of the ATOS report. The decision letter had been lifted almost verbatim from the ATOS report. None of the evidence I had submitted had been referred to. Even statements within the ATOS report that agreed with my evidence were ignored. For example, that I walked very slowly or had a weak grip. I contacted my GP surgery for some information. There were changes in the year it took, but also I asked for copies of information submitted to D the DWP. I had asked the GP surgery for some evidence when I submitted the form, but had been advised to let the DWP request it. When I requested the information for the reconsideration, they agreed to reduce the administration charge to £5, which was still a struggle. It looks like no information was requested by the DWP from them. The decision letter 
came for the reconsideration before I had a chance to submit the information. It was only three weeks after the original decision, but referred to not having received my additional evidence. I contacted my MP's office again, but the lady who had helped me before was on leave, and the person I spoke to said he thought it was a reasonable period. Collating the evidence took longer than I'd expected. I'd been put off by the preemptive reconsideration. During that period, a lot had happened. The job was much bigger than I thought, and with no energy and difficulty with concentration, progress was very slow. The submission ended up being massive. By this stage, it was a late appeal. During this period, I had also been assessed for ADHD, which was diagnosed in December. Although I had not known about this at the time of the form, I had described the symptoms, but put them down to ME brain fog. For me, this explained why activities at work which had structure and support were a lot more manageable than activities at home. The appeal was on the 27th of March, and the panel seemed a lot less hostile than for my DLA one, although the same judge was present. The welfare rights officer thought it had gone well, but was given a letter stating the same four mobility points that Atos had given me were awarded. I'm awaiting a statement of written reason, but my experience after the DLA tribunal was that there's very little that can be counted as an error in law, which is the only relevant thing left now. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Mari, and all of the witnesses. Um, and thanks for being so generous with the personal information that you've provided us. I'm sure the committee members will, will want to explore a bit further some of the, the circumstances that you outlined to us. But can I kick off by sort of trying to get some clarification on your understanding of the process? And we've looked at the work capability assessment in the past, and initially there was a lot of confusion about the role of ATOS and the role of the, the Department of Work and Pension. Uh, even to the extent that the DWP were referring to ATOS assessments, knowing full well that it was their assessments. Um, so it's just to, to try and get an understanding of your knowledge of, of the process. All of you refer to being assessed by ATOS. But in certain parts of Scotland, the process is conducted by SALIS. Were any of you um, assessed by SALIS, or did you know that it was ATOS? that was doing it directly? It was Atos. <coughs> okay. Um, I think there's a geographical split. You know, some parts of the country are covered by Salas and others by Atos. Um, regardless of that, the assessment process, uh, whoever carries it out, does it on the basis of assessments that are um, uh, the, the work of the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, did all of you know that that was the situation, that these assessments were actually the, the work of the DWP and not ATOS themselves? Yeah. I'd just like to say that I've had to phone the DWP and ATOS. And when you phone the DWP, the people on the phone are absolutely delightful. And they're very quick to say, We've heard that about Atos. You know, when you start to, to complain, they may be carrying out their bidding, but I think the DWP have taken great comfort that they aren't doing the work and it gives them this opportunity to distance themselves and be so nice on the phone to you because it's not them. Uh, we've heard that, heard that before, <laughs> Lindsay. That just confirms exactly... Uh, the understanding that we've we've built up of, of the process and it certainly confirms to me um, just exactly how that process is being conducted. Um, another question that I have, um, we discovered in previous uh, investigations that we've undertaken that a, additional information which is sought by ATOS from doctors isn't always provided. In your circumstances, was additional information provided by doctors, was it asked for by ATOS, and was it provided by the doctor when it was asked for? It was, they said on the forums that they would ask for the information, um, and my doctors and my rehab team produced reports um, once it went to the reconsideration. 
part of this, the process. They did produce the reports in time for the original uh, assessment, but the, the, he never had them. The person assessing didn't have uh, any of the reports in front of him at all. Yeah. Um, and then when the reconsideration came back, it said they'd had no other further medical reports. Yet I knew, because my rehab team had been giving me the reports that they had written, so I knew they had been written and submitted, and they were telling me that nothing had been... like they didn't have anything. Yeah. Again, that's an interesting point, an important point to establish. Was that the same for everyone else, Mary? surgery wasn't asked for information. They had provided information for the two DLA applications I'd done, and they'd given me copies of the forms they'd completed, um, but they weren't asked for anything. I'd got information from elsewhere. Um, I go to Mindspace Recovery College, and I'd asked them to do a letter, which I submitted with the form, and I'd asked various other people for evidence as well that went in with the form but it was solely the assessment that the decision was based on. We, we submitted um, quite a few letters that had come that we had that were um, consultant letters about the condition. We also gave the name of um, various health professionals including a stroke nurse who was perfectly willing to, to give them information. Um, also a clinical neurologist, but they were not approached for uh, information. So your GP or any of the, the people no. you identify were never contacted? They were never okay. contacted. Okay. Do you have any information, Maud, or is it not? Uh, well, I haven't gone through the PIP, but certainly from like, the DLA days, it uh, took them a while. So, sometimes they asked for it and sometimes they didn't. Okay. That's helpful. I'll open it up to committee members. I'll go to Kevin first. Thank you, convener. Um, Mary, in, in your evidence, you said um, that you had some difficulties in work, but it was more structured. Are you still working just now as well? Um, I was off sick for a year, and then I returned on a part-time basis. Um, it's a Citizens Advice Bureau I work for, so I've been very lucky with the support that I get. And that, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be working. And Moira, you're obviously still at work, and... As you've stated in your evidence, um, if your payment was withdrawn, you wouldn't be work working, which would actually be an additional cost to the state. Yes. Do you think that any of this is logical in any way, shape or form? Uh, no. <laughs> Simple answer. It makes no sense to kind of block my way to work uh, when I can contribute. This seems to be a, a situation which is worrying a lot of folk who are currently living the independent life that you say that you're living in terms of still being able to work. Um, do, you, do you have any shared experiences with others who are in the same boat as you? Do you have any support group or anything that you go to for? Um, I don't. Um, I haven't felt I've needed to just because that my family and friends are very supportive around me and have a, a good understanding of what's going on. Things like my uh, my elderly, well, she's now getting elderly aunt, she's been very helpful over the years because she used to be an auxiliary nurse in an orthopaedics ward and she understood all the things completely. So when I came out with surgery and had to get my elastic stockings put on, she came round every morning to do it for me. And so I've, I've had a lot of support from family and friends in that way. Thank you. Lindsay, in terms of um, your husband's um, stroke, he worked up until until that point? Absolutely, he worked for the local authority, he still technically works for the local authority. He's um, signed off sick at the moment. Obviously, we're coming up to the year for that, and there has been improvement. Um, I mean, I, I was hoping that PIP was maybe a... A mechanism for them to to go back maybe on reduced hours. It would certainly help that. Um, at the moment, we're we're still very very up in the air. But yes, he's he's worked for at least the last twenty years, and we, and at fifty two hopes hopes to continue working. So he's still working basically. Technically, yeah. yes, yes. And uh, Mrs. Arnott, obviously, you were in work until your accident too. 
Um, I was in work, um, they were very good, they gave me some time off and then they allowed me to come back on a kind of trial basis. I worked for the NHS um, in an orthopaedic ward and I worked on my own because I did weekends, so I was the only physio in the ward um, and it was deemed after two years and a couple of failed attempts at getting back that they couldn't hold the job for me any longer, um, so I was medically retired. But I still have my own practice, which I can't do much in, in terms of hands-on, but I've tried to keep going just so that I had something to go to, um, to do as work. So you went back, you struggled a wee bit, and eventually they retired you on medical grounds. Yes. But you're still actively trying to work. Yes, I do um, blue badge assessments one day a week as part of a... I'm subcontracted to do that. And I can manage that because it's a form... Um, and although um, there are questions on the form that I have to go through and ask people, um, but I also use a bit of my physio knowledge. So if someone has a particular condition, I'm kind of trying to then question them <coughs> that, that line rather than just stick completely to the form. And I feel that the assessment I had for the PIP, I, I think I went into it with that expectation that... Um, the way I do the blue badge assessments would be similar to the way that the assessments would be handled. Um, but yes, I still do one day a week. I can't really do more than one or two days a week um, in terms of working. So we've seen, unfortunately, um, in the press, um, from the mouths of some politicians, this division between strivers and skivers. Um, from what I hear here, you would all fit into the striver category without a doubt, would you say? What do you feel about that use of, of language and this scenario where, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of you, I think it was Lindsay, said almost like begging mm -hmm. after you've put in to the state over a, a period. Lindsay, do you want to... What, how do you feel about all of this? It's easy targets, it's divisive, you are trying to demonise a section of society and, it, and it's, it's wrong obviously, um, it, it, it upsets me and angers me in equal measure. And is that extremely upsetting for your husband, particularly in the situation that he's in? It, it is. Um, he feels that I've pushed him into performing like a monkey at one of these assessments. I feel it's money that you pay your national insurance and that's for the hard times and we should definitely be getting a little help back. Um, but he, of course, has seen the press, the television, and he went very much with the attitude, I'm doing this for you, I will not get this award. Um, and it's kind of true what's happened. He hasn't got the award, and it's, it's actually made things between us difficult, and I, I didn't need that, thank you. Um, so... Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not helpful. It's not helpful that when you think this good this this will catch me when I fall. I've personally worked full time since I was seventeen. Um, I even didn't even have much of a maternity leave break when I had my daughter twenty three years ago. Um, so yeah, the, the, this is something that is new to us you know, claiming some sort of benefit. But going in with the attitude that we're not going to get anything wasn't helpful. And going in with the attitude that I was making him do this didn't help matters either. So a, a lot of strain because mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. the system that's in place at this moment in Absolutely. time. Absolutely. It's offensive. Um, and everybody here is given a story of how they want to use benefit to keep going, not to retire on it and have an easy life. And uh, all you hear in the press or media is about how uh, 
these people are at it, they're taking money out of hard working people's pockets and doing nothing while they're working away and it's just not true and the application process definitely feels like that's the point of view they're taking it from. Um, everybody who applies for PIP is disabled, whether they're disabled according to the criteria that's in place or not is what they're assessing, but people apply for it because they're disabled and uh, they don't treat it like that, they treat it like everybody's trying to um, sort of pull the wool over somebody's eyes and get something for nothing that they're not entitled to. Obviously you've got some experiences at the Citizens Advice as well, Mary. My, my experience in, uh, of, of meeting with folks who have had difficulties, either DLA or PIP, is being used either to keep them in work and keep their independence or to allow another family member to go to work, which wouldn't happen if they didn't have the DLA or PIP. Is that something you've come across in the Citizens Advice Bureau as well? Quite a lot. It's debt I deal with rather than benefits, but a lot of clients I get are in debt and it's quite often things like rent arrears rather than consumer debts and it's been because they've not had enough income to live on. Um, a lot of people have been put off applying for PIP altogether. I see a lot of people with invisible illnesses like I have, um, autoimmune diseases, um, where they can do a little bit today but then if they do it today they can't do it tomorrow. And a lot of them um, either haven't applied at all because uh, they know they're not going to get it or they've not got it. A lot of people are turning to self-employment as a way to try and work around their condition um, where they might not have the option of an understanding employer. And a lot of people in that situation are not earning enough to live on. Um, they're doing more than they should be, their health's deteriorating, but they've just got to keep going. Do you feel that in terms of the assessments that you've had, that you have been listened to in any way, shape or form. Do you think that some of the folks who have done the assessment actually understand the situations that you find yourself in? And if you look at the 20 metres, for example, um, you know, we've had others who have said, yeah, I could walk 20 metres. And as you rightly said, Moira, where does that take you anyway? But, you know, they've said, I can walk 20 metres, but then for the next week, I'm completely out of action. Do, do these folk actually understand that um, that 20 metres is just absolute nonsense? Um, what does it actually prove? I haven't, uh, they haven't assessed me on that yet, but um, 20 metres is clearly not a... It, it's just not a logical distance. I, I don't know what the distance is, but um, <coughs> if there's medical evidence of a disability, <coughs> I don't see whether it's 20 metres or 50 metres is actually relevant. If, if I'm in pain oh, on sure. one step, then I'm in pain at 100 steps and I'll pay for it more tomorrow. So do you think that the assessment itself and you've all experienced in one way, shape or form is, is in any way useful to coming up with uh, a reason why you should or shouldn't get uh, a payment? It's very arbitrary. I mean, with, with this one, it really should have been a proper cognitive assessment or at least you know, look, looked at that, that had been done by a qualified professional. But again, as I said to you, it's a mini mental state test, which is something to, to, to say to somebody who might have a concussion or do they have Alzheimer's. It's not a valid way to test some of these cognitive impairments or even a learning difficulty. Uh, they're they're not they're not decent tests for what you're testing for, and they seem to use the same test for every single person. How how can that possibly be right? Moira, I would agree. I, I would I would hope pass the cognitive assessment quite well, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> but it doesn't, and I won't get any points for that, and that's fair, but that doesn't detract from the fact that I do have uh, a disability and other complications. And I think what it shows is, um, we talked about the Skyver and Striver idea is, yeah, there are Skyvers. There will always be, there always have been. 
uh, and they're easy to get some evidence on. The problem is no one actually looks for all of us because we're at work. Mary? I found uh, when it was the mobility part, um, we're talking about a supermarket. I told them that I go to a small farm foods near me because um, it's very small. I can kind of get most of what I can use out of there in one aisle. Um, and so we were likening the length I would walk of the aisle to the size of the room and um, they set up the assessments so that when you come in to the reception there's a walk between there and the assessment room so they can look at you walking and uh, they commented that I walked very slowly I think it was 10 metres they'd had me walking um, I couldn't finish the physical assessment because I was too fatigued and in pain by then um, and then somehow I can walk 40 or 50 metres, um, no qualification of that, no looking at the other evidence. Um, so it's like an act of tokenism, um, sort of saying we've considered you can walk that amount, we've assessed it, um, it's not up for debate anymore. They didn't look, I've got a blue badge uh, which I got through um, physical condition rather than through the benefit route. And um, I'm virtually unable to walk for that, but miraculously I can walk 50 metres and everything's fine for benefit purposes. Um, the cognitive assessment, I got the same one, the counting back in sevens from 100. Um, at the time of the assessment, I didn't know I had ADHD, but during other parts of the assessment, I was describing difficulties with executive function. Um, things like uh, planning journeys and budgeting. I was explaining where that has an effect on me. Um, budgeting, obviously, I've got specialist knowledge in the work I do, but you take away the structure of being at work and it can be quite different, but uh, they just weren't taking that evidence into account. They ticked the box, they'd done the assessment, I passed that, I could do anything. Um, I was wearing a hat, uh, so they said, you can get your arms over your head, you can cook a meal, you can have a shower every day. The reliability tests, which are supposed to kind of have in the law um, sort of how often you're supposed to be able to do it, how well you're supposed to be able to do it, uh, how much energy you're supposed to have left after having done it, they don't take those into account at all. So most of my case is based around... Um, those reliability tests because I can maybe do something on one day but that's me exhausted and I couldn't repeat it um, but no reference to them at all Alison um, I don't remember very much about the actual assessment itself um, I just remember that it was quite a scary prospect to go through um, I know from what my dad said that I I did um, different tests, like the, the other ladies were saying about counting and um, doing money things. Um, for me, my award in the end, even though I got it, still has that I have no significant cognitive impairment. And for me, it's the cognitive stuff that is the hardest thing to live with. It, completely disrupt my life totally I mean the physical thing that, you know making a meal or whatever yeah okay I struggle with that but that's not really a necessary thing for me my thing is I forget to pick my kids up from school I forget to take them to somewhere I start taking them somewhere and then they go ah but mum you haven't brought that bit in to the plan today you've forgotten that we need to do that step I miss out steps in a recipe and food goes wrong there's so many things like higher functions brain wise and I scored zero for all of these things and it still says even though I've appealed it and I got the award it still says I have no cognitive impairment and I think you said the test that they did like I, I had cognitive tests done by my rehab team and they were extensive like really extensive and I, I had a report produced and I produced that report at my um, assessment that I had to go to um, how like that's that's professional people knowing what they're doing and that they still said no cognitive impairment 
and all the things that he asked me to do, like these other ladies are saying, you know, yeah, once I could lift my arm up and, you know, I could do stuff with my leg. I'm a physio. I pushed myself really hard to get my strength back, even though I have great difficulty with one side. And they just, like, kind of put a finger on my leg and said, can you lift against that? Can you lift against that? There wasn't... There was nothing. Do you know what? I, I just felt... I mean, you, you were talking yeah. all the time, and n when the report came, none of what was said or discussed in the room was mentioned in the report. And I've, we've asked for... You know, you were allowed to ask for the um, assessor's report. You could make a request to put that in, and we still haven't got that, and that was October of last year. Um, so I just feel it's not, it's not a fit assessment, and certainly the way it was done was very cold, very clinical. I'm really anxious anyway, and because it was an, a new person to meet, that immediately makes it very difficult for me. Um, he went away off at speed, <coughs> and we were kind of trying to keep up with him, which I, at that point in time, which was six months ago, I felt I found very difficult to do. Um, and was he going to take us upstairs? Mm -hmm. He was going to take us up the stairs, and it was my dad, and they said, no, I wouldn't manage to do that, and we had to go in the lift, but he wasn't happy. No. <laughs> And he didn't want my mum and dad in the room. Very he, he kept asking, well, why do you need why do you need your parents here? You know, I, I, I just felt I was doing something wrong, being there and asking for this. And I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't the, re the rehab team pushed me to do it. And I put it off for a whole year thinking I'm going to go back to work. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Annabelle, to be followed by Joan. No, and, and thank you very much for your, your frankness. Um, Mr Arnott, you used the phrase about the process not being client-friendly, and I'm aware from reading all your submissions that experiences have ranged from practical difficulties like Mary, and I think you, Mrs Souter, Mary, you wanted to be interviewed in Perth, but you had to go to Dundee, eventually went to Dundee. <coughs> Mrs Souter, you challenged that. You were expected to go to Dunfermline, but eventually you were interviewed in, in Edinburgh. And I was wondering, was location for the interview an issue for, for you, Mrs Arnott, or were you able to be seen where it suited you? Um, I was seen in Stirling, which is not that far away, um, but I wasn't really... Well, I'd never driven to Stirling by that point, so my parents came and took me. Um, I was given a nine o'clock appointment, I have four young children who needed to go to school at nine o'clock, plus my parents were coming from Dundee to pick me up, um, and they wouldn't change the appointment time to a later time in a day. Despite that information being provided? Yes. Um, so although it was, it was close to me because it was only Stirling, it still wasn't as convenient <coughs> as it could have been. Mm -hmm. OK. And can I, can I add that the, the assessment was done at Spring Cares, which is on the outskirts of Stirling, not anywhere near the, the Stirling Centre. So getting access, even public transport, is not possible. Mm -hmm. So that was another factor. It was the remoteness of that from Stirling itself. Mm -hmm. can, uh, can I add my, my friend? Had her assessment the same week as my husband, who lives in the same place I do, was offered North Berwick which, again, to get to from where we we live is impossible. We, it would have been a bus into town to Waverley and then a train out to North Berwick, and then I don't know how you were supposed to get to the assessment centre from then, same week. Convener, does anyone know how the appointment system works? The what we need to do, works? Annabelle, we uh, I've discussed with the clerks what we wanted to try and establish today was some of the issues, and this uh -huh. is clearly one an issue. Them, this is um, and what yes. we have uh, agreed to do is to invite Atos and Salas to come before us. Yes. Um, I'm not sure where we are with that, um, but I know that um, right, that discussion okay. is taking place. Okay. So if we can establish the issues, we'll be able to put them to the organisations in due okay. course. Yeah. I've got a Two more sort of specific <coughs> questions, convener, if I may. Um, Maura, I was very struck by what you were saying in evidence, and I read through your submission and um, 
having had some experience of some of what you're suffering from, I had a lot of sympathy, not least back spasm and the arthritic condition. Is it your impression from what you can understand of the criteria, the DWP criteria, that the criteria are very absolute because you were explaining how one morning, even if it was meaningful, you might be able to walk 20 metres somewhere. Another morning you can't. You probably could just spend three hours getting dressed, crawl into the car, get to place of work. That's, that's not an unusual scenario. And one morning you might not even manage that. No, uh -huh. I, I'm lucky that uh, the nature of my job and my understanding employer is that I can occasionally phone up and go, I'm going to work from home. Mm -hmm. Today, I just, I'm not going to... Because you can't physically get I out. I don't do it often. Cause uh -huh. I'm, I'm <laughs> and, and so do you feel that these criteria are too absolute? There's not enough flexibility to... Well, there's no understanding of any, a changing condition, or a, and there also seems to be no understanding that you, you might manage that, but it, it doesn't mean it's easy. And, no, and, and you manage it because you're forcing yourself to do it. I understand. And you might manage a trip to the supermarket yeah. but be in very considerable pain the following I day. My, my routine is I go to supermarket with my father because I can't carry stuff. That just adds to, to pain. Um, we, we go to our particular bits. We'll, we need that, that and that. I, I, this wandering up and down is not, <laughs> not for me. We'll drive home. He'll carry all the shopping into the, the house. I'll get into the house sit down, he makes me a hot water bottle, <laughs> I get my foot up on a, a stool and that's it, I'm, I'm there, that I then don't move for the rest of the, the day. <laughs> for, so for someone with your condition, the inflexible nature of their criteria is not actually getting a proper picture of what life is like for you. It doesn't get any picture of, of, of my life at all. Oh. And uh, well, as I said in the submission, I mean the, the evidence is there. My bones are are showing up on an X-ray. I've had surgeries which were not done for just amusement, but that doesn't seem to be considered at all. So if if I can drag myself twenty meters to achieve something, then that's enough. I'm not. I will no longer be eligible. And, and convener, reaching on from that, what struck me from the submissions was what seems to me the absolute pointless bureaucracy of if you have a diagnosed condition, the consequence of which is very restricted and increasingly restricted mobility, what on earth is the point of having to go back for further assessments and interviews? Fight to make <coughs> comment mm -hmm. on your condition. Because mm -hmm. as you so pointedly said, you know, your surgeons didn't make up the operations, your x-rays are there. Well, I'm, I'm not going to grow a new skeleton, it's, it's only going to deteriorate further. So I've, I've been through all the appeals for the DLA, got to the point of an indefinite award, and I'm now back at the beginning of the process again. Nothing in my condition will have changed. The prospect, Moira, that assuming you satisfy the new criteria for a, for a PIP, it's, it's the revisiting of the assessment that's both very worrying and I, very, I very disruptive. I, I do not think I will get pit. I have no expectation now that they'll award it. I'll certainly appeal it. I'll put in all my evidence. But if they stick to a can you drag yourself 20 metres, I won't qualify. But you'd be entitled to say, <laughs> now and again I can drag myself 20 yeah. metres, but in between I can't drag myself anywhere. Yes. And that's what the inflexibility of the criteria is unable to pick up on. Mm -hmm. And you also said that at the moment um, your your status as a passport for your blue badge, I mean, this is a factual question, I don't know the answer, is PIP a passport to a blue badge? Or is that, Andy, maybe no. you know, I um, Alison? It, it is if you have the, the points have from it. higher yeah. mobility. If you're on the highest level for mobility and the highest be. level for... Um, your actual award, then you will get automatically qualified for a blue badge. Mm -hmm. But you still have to 
for the blue badge, you still have to fill in the application form to be told that you automatically mm -hmm. qualify for a blue badge. And the application form is really, I know, because they come in every day and they're worried that they didn't write the right information on the mm -hmm. forum. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is the same sort of yeah, system. Not, it's just slightly yeah. better. But, uh, who are on DLA, but I've never applied for a blue badge. But they would be entitled to it if they applied right, for it. Right, OK. And I think my final question, convener, with your indulgence is, going back to your general point, Mr Arnott, about the process not being client-friendly and listening to what, you know, you have all encountered, I mean, do, do you get the impression that despite the hugely detailed nature of the form, that once you got into the interview, there was some kind of disconnect between the information you'd provided in the form and the questions you were being asked. And you obviously felt frustrated in some cases that the information that had been provided and the information at the interview you were providing did not actually get through a filter into the final report. In my impression... The witnesses are nodding their agreement. My impression really was that the assessor had probably read through the report the, 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 but then started off on a clean sheet straight away. Even if the information he started putting into the computer was right back at the very beginning again. And then all the information was there. For example, all Alison's medication had to be refed back into the computer. Yeah. So there's no link up between the two and there's no recognition on the way he treated Alison of her condition. There's no recognition that she had difficulty with, me with memory or anything else. That was all ignored. And it was just cold. What you might have anticipated was that the information you provided would be the kind of yes. bedrock for the interview, and exactly. then questions yes. could be asked round the issues highlighted in the form. Yes, very much so. No, thank you very much, convener. Thank you. you. Joan, to be followed by Claire. Thank you, convener, and thank you to the witnesses um, for, for taking the time to speak to us today. I personally found it in very, very informative. And I wanted to address my first question to Mr Gray and, and Mrs Arnott. Just going, going through um, your, your, um, your evidence today, when you talked about how you had um, f failed on appeal and then you said, you told Atos you were going to a tribunal and then the way it comes across is that almost arbitrary, you then heard, have you any idea of what made them change their minds? No, that's, I, I, have, I have no idea. I mean, we, we were literally a week away from the tribunal date and I got another letter in. In fact, I tell you, to be perf I've, I've just remembered, um, to be perfectly honest, I got a letter in. My OT was in with me, so she was even witness to it. I got a letter in saying I had got a Christmas bonus, which the letter came in March. I got a, a Christmas bonus um, as part of my award for PIP. And I'm thinking, well, I don't have an award for PIP. And then the day after that, I got a letter through saying that um, the decision had been made not to go to tribunal and that I was to get the full PIP that I had applied for. Yeah, they the would have had the opportunity to do that much earlier because the, all the evidence, including what you submitted for your appeal, uh, the, was very extensive, wasn't it? I mean, I was... I, by that time, I was absolutely worked up. Like, I was totally frightened of going to the appeal and didn't really know what I was going to do when I got there. Um, I didn't really want to go. I just wanted it to all be over and just not bother anymore. Um, so to be up like that and then to get this letter, like, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. It was that kind of... And I didn't really understand it. I had to, I phoned. I had to phone the people to say, is this right? You know, because it it just seemed to just come in the post. I'm scared of the post as it is. That's one of the things I've I've, I've now that now happens. So all these letters that come are um, like they make me very anxious anyway. So to get all these letters and then to find out at the end that they were giving it to me anyway was a bit pointless. So they put you through all that stress and, and possibly you know like you 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 were entitled all along about they put you through all that stress um is it your intention to obviously i mean we imagine the way you are you want to move on um but have you given any thought to kind of trying to find out what made them change their mind in such an arbitrary way 
Yes, I've still asked for the um, assessor's report from the original um, assessment that I had, and I've also asked because I had a welfare officer helping me because um, there was no way I could do the form um, myself, and he's asked as well for information because he was handling my case for the tribunal, and he was given no information either. He was just told that um, my case had been withdrawn from the tribunal date. So we don't know. This is and it's going across the panel, the, this whole issue of ap appeals, and it's, it's obviously something that comes up a lot. And it's, we know from national statistics that quite often these ATOS decisions are overturned on appeal. And I think you, yourself, Moira, I think you said that three times a decision. There was more. That That's back in DLA terms. But yes, it was... Uh, you don't get it, I appeal, you got it for a year, apply again, don't get it, appeal, get it for a year. And that went on. I think I had four or five one-year awards and then two or three three-year awards <coughs> and then they eventually gave me my indefinite award. And yet your disability between these different assessments and appeals, I assume, was the same? Exactly the same and deteriorating, if anything. Yes. And so do you, do you think that... In, do, do you sometimes get the impression that they're working to targets then and that it's only by pushing them on appeal that they then arbitrarily change their decision? That, that was certainly, as I went through the DLA process, yes. They'll mm -hmm. just automatically discount everyone in the hope that that'll knock off a certain percentage that won't appeal and then it'll carry on like that. Mm -hmm. And... In terms of um, your own experience, what, what comes across, and I know that co other colleagues have brought this up, is the almost disregard of, of medical evidence. But my understanding from reading some of our briefings on what PIP is supposed to be is that actually at the very heart is that medical evidence is not supposed to inform PIP because it's supposed to be not the condition but what you can actually do. Um, and when we had actually evidence from the chap who, who was appointed by the government to review how PIP assessments were being done, he was keen to ensure that the assessments um, were, were not seen as medical assessments. I suppose if they're, if they're done by a non-medic and that non-medic is not taking into account the medical evidence because that's not what PIP's supposed to be in the legislation, it kind of really... It really kind of questions the the whole um, the legislation itself, not the way it's not the way it's been conducted, not the day to day <coughs> assessments, but at its very heart, at its very philosophy, it, it's flawed because it's it's ignoring the medical condition. Really, it's saying that's not relevant. I wondered what what you thought of that. I kind of had great hopes for PIP because having been turned down for DLA twice, I thought there's a point system that's going to be. Um, there's not that kind of flexibility for somebody to just decide one way or another. Uh, there's a kind of format for it. Um, I thought <coughs> the reliability tests were built into a law. Um, when I was given the training information from work to uh, do my reconsideration, um, it looks like that was put in there to take a lot of case law out of the equation rather than um, anything else. There's been a lot of case law for DLA and they wanted to kind of preempt that. Um, so in theory they do have the workings, if they applied it as it was written, they do have the workings to catch most disabilities. Um, I think taking out the low rate um, has probably made a big difference. Um, it kind of means you've either got to be more disabled if you're at that kind of level or just um, ignore it altogether, which a lot of people kind of just fall through the gap there. But uh, I think there are sort of tests. I think the levels that they're set at, so we've talked about the mobility distance and stuff, um, need changed, but theoretically having a point scoring system and um, different levels of inability, so it's like two points if you need a aid to do something, um, a bit more if you need somebody to do it for you, but uh, they could do a fair assessment based on what's written if they actually applied it as it was, but there seems to be another agenda that's 
using this system to kind of avoid considering other evidence, whether it's medical, uh, whether it's from carers saying, I do this for this person because they're not able to do it. Um, it just seems to be an act of tokenism again. That, uh, they're saying they've done a full assessment because look, they've done all this stuff, but uh, actually it's just bypassing a lot of support for people. Thank you very much. What do you think of that, Lindsay? Your husband's had a stroke. You've had all this help from the medical professionals who are supporting him, and yet the process is sort of demedicalised, if you like, of assessing him. It has, but they also ignored the, the reliability criteria. We, we were saying, that, like everybody with any sort of condition, I may be, be able to do this today, but I will pay for it tomorrow. The aids and adaptations, that's really... I mean, to me, someone who needs to manage medication by putting it in the big box with the, the, the days and times, who has to set alerts on phones, iPads, um, who has to be prompted to do something, that's an aid to take your medication. Now, that should be two points. My husband scored zero uses all these things. It was in the form that we used it. The form was ignored. So really what we should have done was <coughs> went, you know, stop what you're doing. Let's go through the form page by page. But you don't do that. You go in. They're in control. You sit where you're told to sit. You speak when you are spoken to. It, you know, it's not something I'm doing every day going into something like that. So you, you're totally on the back foot and for people with any sort of condition it's the anxiety you're not I don't want to go in as a carer all guns blazing making a fuss because it's not going to help anybody but sometimes I'm sitting thinking to myself do you know what that's exactly what I should have done they should have remembered me in that room till their dying day and I, I feel really guilty that I did not help in that in that room in that process, but I was trusting. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, coming back to your point about medical information, I think it's important that there should be there available because it informs the whole the whole process of assessment. What the state said is what's capable, what's not capable. So why go back and doubt a professional's opinion? about what the person can do and can't do. In Alison's case, it would be very clear they've got right-sided weakness, so why test it when it's been medically proven to be so? Same with the head injury. It would say this is her problems. She wouldn't have had the problem of a cognitive test, all that upset that came from that. So the medical evidence should inform the process. It's not the diagnosis, which doesn't matter, but it's information on how it impinges on the daily life should be important. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, before coming to clear, I'm just going to abuse my position and just to, to, to go back to something that, that Moira said. Um, you made the point about this perception that the DLA was just automatically rejected at the first application in order to test the determination of the applicant to come back again. Well, that's something I've heard before and I've heard it personally through a, a family experience. But it goes back decades. It's not something that's, that's recent. Um, so can you give us an indication. When did you first apply for DLA? Um, I was <coughs> still at university, so that would be uh, was about halfway through, so probably 90, something like that, 1990-ish. So, uh, yeah, it's been a while. So, so <laughs> we're, we're going talking through this process. We're talking about the, the reform of welfare, but that's something that's clearly not been reformed in the, <laughs> the decades intervening. But I just wanted to clarify that no, because I, I think it's important to know that you know, we're going from this DLA situation to PIP, but there were clearly problems with the DLA uh, yeah. situation which don't appear to be being rectified by this transformation to the new system. Uh, Claire? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Convira. I think um, a lot of my, my points have been covered. Um, can I just say um, I am so pleased that you have come in today to put this on record and to give your evidence today. Um, my main concern coming from all of this is, is that um, I, I, you maybe want to comment is that the whole system is absolutely dehumanising. Um, and, and I think it was Mary had said that she thought 
she was made to feel as if she was just after an easy life. And I think anyone that thinks that any of you has an easy life after today um, will be, um, you know, put right on that completely. Um, but I, I do have great concern about, uh, about what you're expressing, about how this made you feel. Uh, Miss, uh, Miss Sarna as well talked about her professional judgment as as a health professional in her own area in this. And um, I, you know, fundamental question for me is, do, do you think any of this was necessary or do you think your medical practitioner should at the final say, given the complexities of the conditions involved? I think it, it, it's completely unnecessary. Certainly in my case, I, I still to go through the PIP which I expect to be turned down for, but I don't see any point going through it. I have an indefinite award. They've done all the medical evidence. Everything's there. Why bother with the time, effort, expense of going through that again? And then, even if I get it, it's like, well, you'll give, get, it might be back to every year, every three years, going back and doing it all again. And that just adds to all of our burden for trying to do everything else. But it just seems so unnecessary. I've been assessed. I've been assessed many times. Nothing's going to change, so why reassess me? Certainly, my point would be um, I understand there are some more temporary awards and things, but if anyone has an indefinite award and has fought to get to that point of having an indefinite award, someone has made the judgment that it's unlikely to improve and the medical evidence will have been considered for that. So, why drag us all through it again? It seems pointless. I would say that um, my, I'm worried because the things I feel I have the main problems with that are now we know not going to get better is the cognitive side of things. My physical side of things is still improving bit by bit. And to be honest, on the points thing, in the end, it was the physical aspects of things that they focused on again and not the cognitive. And I do kind of feel that I only got my award for like a year it finishes in October or something. Um, and I kind of feel that the problems I really have will still be there. But the problems that they deemed I had may not be there, so will, will I then not qualify anymore? And that's a big worry. And I also worry because I now feel that when I'm out and about, because it was the physical aspect that they focused on, I'm scared to walk properly or you know even get out of a car or I'm scared to go to the cinema with my kids or in case somebody thinks I've got it and I shouldn't have it but actually there's a whole lot of problems going on that has never been recognised and like that I mean I think if you have a permanent condition I don't really think it's, a, it's fair or necessary money wise as well for you know it to be funded when I do the blue badge assessments, if somebody has a chronic condition and they qualify for <coughs> the badge at the time that I'm doing that particular assessment, I will always put on the forum that I don't think there was any need to reassess and why, you know, as in this is never going to improve, it's only going to stay the same or get worse. And I feel a, a similar system for the, the PIP and the welfare would definitely be helpful for a lot of people. And it would mean then that you're you're only assessing the ones that actually do need assessed. You know, someone going for an operation gets better. So yeah, they need assessed again. And it feels like an exercise in jumping through hoops rather than anything else. And um, uh, and I've got the ME I do hope to recover from. It's about five or six years I've had it now, but it is a condition that people do recover from. And I think if I was getting support to be able to do things to help it, that probably that would help me to recover and then not need to claim again. Um, but uh, having um, been through it three times, twice with Yelly and once with Poop, I'm now at the point where I'm exhausted with it. It's not just that assessment or filling in the form or going to the tribunal for the whole 18 months that PIP application's been running it's made me fixate on um, every little thing I've had a problem with um, or every time I've overdone it and paid for it, I think that would be good for remembering to mention it appeal and it just makes it dominate your brain um, months I was sort of looking for the postie coming, wondering if there was going to be a brown envelope with a decision in it. 
and um, and I've got a lot of support. I'm quite lucky, obviously, working where I do. I've got a lot of knowledge that I wouldn't otherwise have. But for somebody that doesn't have that support and going through that, um, I think it does just have a really big effect of making people not want to apply for it. And I think that's probably part of the aim, to discourage people to a point where they find a way to cope without it or um, convince themselves that, they don't need it and they're not entitled to it, so they just don't bother. It's a Kafkaesque nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got the letter saying, get get yourself to Dunfermline, I, I should have just taken that, oh, this is how we're going to play it then. Um, but, you know, I'm not, you know, we're, we're still trockling on with this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christina and then Margaret. Thanks very much, uh, convener, and thank you so much for, for, for sharing uh, as much as, as you have this morning. The convener asked us to focus on things that we can maybe pick up in our, our further evidence, and I've got a couple of things just from, from how, how you've spoken this morning. Um, one of the things is about time taken for assessment decisions, and Mary, you've been very, very vivid in your explanation of that. What I would like to know is what is the financial impact of that on your your household bills, your ability you know, to um, attend medical appointments or to attend therapies? Um, is, is there a huge impact waiting, you know, for that to come along um, uh, to make, you know, these things a bit easier? I've kind of got a bit of a time bomb. I was very lucky to get my dad's old car when he replaced it and I can't afford to keep it on the road. It's 14 years old. It's my only way of getting about. I have my blue badge, I basically drive the distances I used to walk. I've got a bus pass, but the bus stop's too far away to use it regularly. Um, so just had to do a load of work for the car MOT and had to go to my mum and dad and ask them to uh, help out, which I know not everybody's got a mum and dad who can do that. Um, things that might help, for example, I used to go to the health suite at my local swimming pool, um, things like a sauna helped with pain. I just can't afford to do that now. Um, physiotherapy, um, I was trying some sort of paced exercise to try and keep my health strength up, which did help for a little while. I can't afford to do that. Um, and because I'm not getting help around the house, I did have somebody come in to help prepare vegetables for me, um, which I can't afford to do. So I'm having to use all my energy just to kind of get myself fit to go to work and do my job and come home. So I don't have the energy to put into things like therapeutic activity. Um, don't have the money to try alternative therapies or supplements that might help things out. So it's kind of meant I'm stuck. Um, I think I would be able to kind of pull myself out of it a little bit better if I could sort of get all the support in place, if I could focus my energy on the things that only I can do and get a bit of help. I've got friends helping out, things like walking my dogs. I get a dog walker once a week when my friend can't do it, but the rest of the week it's a friend doing it for me and I can't even afford to take him out for lunch to say thanks for doing that. Um, I kind of want my friends to be my friends and everything has to rotate around my care needs so um, it would be nice to kind of have that taken care of and just enjoy their company rather than making demands of them all the time. Yeah. You recover? Yeah. I know that um, you said your husband's still technically in work but you'll be on half pay now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So waiting any length of time waiting for a decision will have a, a huge impact maybe on your ability you know, to keep the house heated and things like that, is that Well, what, is that? yes, I, I, I did just get a, a gas bill and Scottish Gas wanted to put my payment up to quite a substantial amount because obviously he's been in the house 24-7 since this happened. Um, obviously, because we were both working reasonably well-paid jobs for, for the local authority, I've been able to, to do all these complex financial things that apparently my husband can manage <coughs> as a plum. Um, so I have managed to move suppliers of things. I have managed to get much better deals with various insurers. Um, 
I will be trying to renegotiate something with the bank with the mortgage, but of course that's very interim. Um, something like a PIP award helps you plan because you know that actually that will come in and then we can we can plan better. So at the moment I'm firefighting. We're, we're, we're not in any bother here, but you know, definitely firefighting. Um, as I said, my daughter's at university and there's a lot of expense and you would choose to, to help help your children out, don't you? You know, bank mum and dad. So um, at the moment, I'm just firefighting, doing what I can, cutting costs here and there. But how long can this <coughs> go on? I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, Alison, you, you, you'll have some understanding of this and, and Mary's touched on it. Is that all of that, the waiting... And, for up assessments, waiting for decisions, <coughs> the anxiety uh, and the stress that goes along with that. Has your medical uh, um, rehab team that you mentioned uh, talked about the impact that's having on your, your sustained recovery? Yes. Um, the, I think they, they've been treating me a lot for the kind of stress and that anxiety um, and that <coughs> a, lot of that, a lot of my rehab recently has been for all that, um, things like getting a, a no, a refusal letter just kind of put me back, you know, a month and I had to kind of get myself back to the kind of point I was at before and then I would get another letter through and I'd be away back to what I was. So it's been very hard to kind of get myself out of that kind of low dip, plus the fact, like, <coughs> I, I wasn't earning really anything. I, I was on... Um, I was on the usual thing for a year. I had pay and then I had half pay. <coughs> but thereafter, I was on a year of unpaid leave from my NHS job. And although I had my own practice, I was actually just paying people to run it, not making anything at all. So the pressure I felt because I could no longer contribute, my wages were the things that the girls did. So, do you know, my husband's paid the bills. So <coughs> the, bills, the bills were still being paid. Um, and it's only been through like family members and things that my daughters have been able to continue with their activities, which is important. You know, this accident has had a big impact on them. Um, and until I got my award, um, they had been wanting me to go to like a gym program, um, which was fine. Um, but I had to pay for it. Like I've got to pay a gym membership to go to this rehab program that they want me to go to. So I'm now going, and I'm actually <coughs> feeling the benefit of it. But that's because I don't feel guilty anymore because I've now got the award I can use. I can justify that money because I'm getting it. I couldn't take that out of my budget for my girls because that's not fair. And it's something for me. And so that was really holding things up, I think. I don't feel I made as much physical <coughs> progress for a year as I could have done. Um, it's been very hard. Yeah. And Moira, you painted very, very vividly on your evidence about how this situation can make you feel uh, to the to the point that you become so low. Um, how how does that have an impact on you? Just getting? Did you say it takes sometimes a few hours in the morning to pull yourself together? But if you're already feeling really low, how much more difficult is that? It, it's it's always and it's always at the back of your head. And I haven't hit it yet, the pit, but it, every day it gets that little bit closer. The fear of what might happen if I get to the point that. Um, they turned me down for PIP, even though I would appeal. At that point, DLA stopped, and then I think it's within so many weeks, they'll come and take the motability car away. OK, then what do I do? I've got no award, I've got no car. How am I going to get to work the next day? How long is my employer going to let that slide on before I don't have a job? At which point, mm -hmm. well, how long is it after that that I can't pay the mortgage and I, I can't put food on the table? And that is always a worry at the back of your head. And even <coughs> if I appealed and then got the PIP, in that intervening time, so much of my life could have changed almost irreversibly that it's it's terrifying. I mean, I, as I said, I'm single, it's me. I'm in my house. My dad lives with me. Am I going to make my, my elderly dad, who survived cancer and looked after me, am I going to make him homeless because I can't work because... I can't get a car, because it's a, and it all rolls up, and that, that might seem hugely dramatic, but that's what's going through <coughs> your head. What are the potential implications of the fear of, of all of this? 
Um, I've just got a couple other things. Uh, one one thing that, that struck me was about um, the the actual assessment and the unnecessary parts of the assessment based on the individual. Now it seems to me, you know, the the key thing missing out of personal independence payment is the personal part of it. Um, and the fact that you're, you're, you know, you're, you've been asked, or your, your husband's been asked to, to take parts and bits of the assessment that really, you know, wouldn't give an insight, but other parts like medical records and all that are being ignored. Did a, at any point did any of the assessors tell you what their qualifications were in, whether they were trained in specific uh, means of, of assessments? Um, I think it was yourself, Alison, says about inappropriate cognitive. Um, assessments, um, whether, I think it was yourself as well, um, whether, you know, they should be done by a professional or not. Um, it, it strikes me, you know, as if maybe the, the level of training that the assessors have got is maybe something we should look at and um, investigate. I wonder if that's maybe your experience. And did any of them actually tell you what their, their qualifications were? I never even got a name. Okay. <laughs> me at my assessment but when I got the report it said he was a nurse. Um, I'd had an ESA assessment in 2012 and that had been done by a nurse as well and she seemed to have a real understanding of ME and um, she was asking questions along the right lines and um, she didn't do the physical assessment at all because she said you might be able to do it now but then you might not be able to do it another day so it's meaningless so there seems to be quite a lot left up to the individual on how they do it and from work and speaking to people it seems the ones that have a good assessment get it and the ones that don't don't get it so um, the definitely my experience it was the decision was basically written out by that nurse as well so uh, whatever his medical background he's certainly not got a benefits background and I think he definitely wasn't qualified to do something that then somebody in the DWP just rubber stamped and uh, didn't look at anything else. I mean, in Alison's case, <coughs> the assessor said that he was some some form of qualification he gave it. That, not sure what it was. It might have been a nurse, but he said that as he sat down before he'd actually introduced himself or whatever, it was a very brief, almost in passing, and didn't mean anything at all. I didn't pick it up eventually what his actual qualification was, but he tried to justify his assessment by qualification. But it was not part of something here's important for you. Alison never got it at all. And that's the most important thing. She should have known what his qualification was. Yeah. Same sort of a thing for you, Moira, yeah. I haven't had the, the yeah, right enough. The final thing I've got I've got to ask you all is um at a time in your life when your husband has, you know, a stroke, you have a, a long term condition, you have a long term condition and you have an accident. You need to be able to trust the system to look after you. Would any of you say you trust it? No. No? <coughs> no absolutely not. And I think that's one of the most important things, that you have to have trust in a system. Thanks, convener. Yeah, and finally, Margaret. Thank you, convener, and thank you all very much for um, coming along here today and for being so frank with us this morning. And... Uh, well, lots of the questions have already been asked, so I'll try and cover uh, a couple of things that I think uh, we haven't touched on. And one of them being the mandatory reconciliation. Um, how difficult was that actually to to go through? Did you immediately know that, you know, how do you find out about what happens next? I mean, you go and you're assessed, but um, what advice are you given about if you're unhappy with the decision or, you know, either you're refused or you're not happy with the actual level of um, disability that you've been acknowledged with? So how available is that information? There's maybe a three or four page decision letter and the date that you have your deadline for doing the considerations buried somewhere on page three, I think. So most people would kind of look what's the answer, maybe look for some sort of justification of it. But uh, it's not something that jumps out at you. Um, I knew a bit more than most people would from having my friends at work. Um, 
but even then it was a last minute operation um, I had to phone in just to meet the deadline and then I wasn't allowed that time to submit the information so I didn't really get a mandatory reconsideration as such I got the letter which let me go on to appeal but and again the deadline once you've had that for appealing is buried deep in a letter um, and there's supposed to be a process where it goes back to reconsideration if more information is submitted after it's been to a mandatory reconsideration it's supposed to go back there first before it goes on to appeal but that wasn't what happened in my case so the evidence hasn't really been looked at as a mandatory reconsideration just a ATOS report that was already there. I only got information about that really through um, Grapevine, the charity that had helped us fill the form out in the first place. When it um, when it came to writing the letter, which of course, as I've said, we're, we're still waiting. They, they've, they've had it since the 30th of March and we're still no further forward. Um, I actually used my background as of taking legislation and putting it into a form that mortals can understand. I took all the legislation, um, especially um, some of the statutory instruments, and I wrote my letter based on the fact that I didn't believe that they had used the reliability criteria in any of the tests. Um, I completed the letter and I, the charity looked at it and went, wow, well done. Uh, we submitted it and that was that. But if I hadn't had that particular skill set, obviously I would have relied on somebody creating the letter for me. Um, so, yeah, the only reason I knew to do that was I had had help. And um, so, as you know, we've heard in er earlier this morning, it's so difficult for um, people who are applying to know exactly what what is available to them and um, also you know these support agencies that are there you've got to know that they're there so it is quite difficult then for you to actually find out I mean one of the things when that gentleman who came along from the government to speak to us um, they did acknowledge that the decision letters would be looked at, if I'm right. So they are going to go away and look at these decision letters again. So hopefully it will be more <coughs> easily noticeable. Um, you know, you see the decision and what uh, action you can take to follow on from that. So we'll wait and see if these decision letters are actually improved and they, they do meet the test. Um, so the support agencies, how difficult is it then to get in touch with them? And do you find now, because of everything that's happened with this welfare reform, um, that it's more difficult, for ex example, you work with Citizens Advice, to get an appointment with them? Because, you know, a couple of years back, you would have been able to pop into the Citizens Advice and see someone there and then, whereas now, I believe, you can actually have to wait a week or, or even more, depending where you are, to get an appointment with a citizen's advice. And likewise, you know, the other um, agencies that you're dealing with, Grapevine, I think you mentioned, and, you know, you, you've got other agencies that support you. How difficult is it? Um, obviously, I had a kind of sneaky backdoor route because I'm friends with the benefit advisors and they were kind of doing it as friends rather than with their work hat on but I know I see people as a debt advisor who they've already got into the rent arrears and they didn't know that the CAB could help them with application or that the benefits were relevant to their situation so quite often I'll then refer somebody for a benefits check um, there's been quite a few projects funded at Perth CAB for benefit uh, casework so there's been more help than there is um, a benefit check. Sometimes we're waiting a couple of weeks for an appointment for somebody. Um, even with all those extra staff. And uh, because I put form, they sort of allow three hours for that. And it might take a couple of goes even at that. Um, and sometimes it's done by home visits. So usually people are asked when the deadline is and uh, try and squeeze them in 
before their deadline. Uh, but not everybody gets the form and then comes straight to the CAB. Sometimes people try and fill it in and it's only at the deadline and there's not a lot of time. So then they would have to go and ask for another form. Um, but yeah, there definitely isn't enough support to meet the need. So, so many of the third sector agencies don't have the capacity they used to between uh, various uh, changes to, to the way they get their funding. A lot of um, <coughs> local authorities have had to make significant cuts to their third party grants and perhaps housing support contracts with these agencies. So some of them are closing their doors, some of them are coming out of particular areas um, when they lose the funding. So I did have to wait to get my appointment and that was fine and I was great, really grateful to get it. But I, I do know that so, so many agencies just, they're either gone or they don't have the capacity and that's that's caused, that's caused that. Okay. The extra capacity at Perth, it's been project funded rather than core funding, so it could be next year that's all gone and we're back to the one or two people doing all the benefits casework. Mm -hmm. um, in your experience, um, the time taken to respond to your applications. How often have the ta well, you know, the targets that they have? They're supposed to respond within a certain time. How often have they been uh, met or not met? And you know, the return because it is seems to take forever to get a response, and you know, the, the additional stress that that adds to everyone. You send them a letter. 17th of March. It's not logged on their system till the 30th and I'm still waiting for a response to that letter. The original PIP, I mean, I've completely forgotten, but we applied, it was in December and it, I think it was February that we got the actual face-to-face -face assessment. So I, I don't think they're, they're meeting, they may be meeting their targets, but I don't think they're decent targets if, if that's a reasonable amount of time to wait. I, because, sorry, Alison. No, I was just going to say, I think I, I waited from completing the actual form with the citizen's advisor. Um, I think it was about seven months before I got my face-to-face -face, um, interview. And then it was this, the, they kept to their time scales for the reconsideration. In fact, they were, they were quicker, as in they were early. Um, and again, my rehab team said that would be so that they didn't have any reports, which they hadn't received medical reports. Um, but then after that, when I was then going to the tribunal, you were talking, that was another three months before I got a date for the tribunal. So the whole process took more than a year to kind of, from start it's to It was a long time, because in that time, obviously, there's people get into financial difficulties as well as all the stress and what it does to their because health Because I forget condition. things. It was really <coughs> difficult for me to keep on, like, one, for me, one week mm -hmm. or five weeks feels the same. Do you know, five weeks can go by in my house and I don't realise that we're on week five and I think we're on week one. So sometimes like that, I'm not on top of chasing anything up. It's very, very difficult if I have to chase something up to keep on it. So that's, you know, some of that is that I've forgotten to phone people or, but really that's not my fault. I don't feel. No. And particularly difficult with people for who have mental health um, issues as well, to keep on top of that. The other thing I was quite aware of, I have similar difficulties to Alison in terms of time blindness and uh, sort of, um, anxiety about phoning up when I did remember to do it so it took me until March or April to do it and then the assessment happened in April. I don't know if that made any bearing or that was when it was going to happen from my form going in in August but uh, there's sort of an awareness that uh, they do measure things that aren't what they tell you part of your assessment so like walking to the assessment room and you think if I phone up is this going to go against me? They're going to say, no, you are obviously on top of everything because you phoned to chase us up. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really difficult for um, people who are claiming 
in, in these situations. Um, I suppose around the, the managing budgets and, and that kind of thing, where, how could they improve on these assessments that they're, you know, they're asking, or should they just be tailored to meet the individuals? The old system actually wasn't bad, not how it was executed, but uh, you used to be able to request an EMP, a doctor, to come and do an assessment if you needed more evidence. So I had that for one of my DLA applications where there wasn't so much medical evidence there, I was fairly newly diagnosed, there wasn't a lot documented about the actual difficulties I had. Um, and that particular doctor, who's the one I referred to in my submission, um, gave me a lot of advice and wrote down what he told me. But, and obviously don't want that happening, but in <coughs> principle, if there's a case where there's not a lot of evidence, where um, there's a bit of a grey area, then having that as an option to sort of build on the evidence can be helpful. But to just put everybody through it when there's... Uh, already enough evidence to make a decision. Um, like Moira said, uh, their skeleton's not going to regrow itself. If there's information there that's sort of indisputable, then somebody else looking at it, and perhaps somebody else who's not so qualified, um, they're only going to get a different answer by not looking at the right information. Sorry, Alison, did you want to say, I think about that you were asking about the budgeting um, things. Um, on the form, I think it says complex mm -hmm. budget making decisions or something like that. Like for me, taking whatever, I was, I was asked to take 75 pence away from a pound, which I couldn't do in my head, which I still can't do in my head, and then to count back from 20 or something like that I had to do how did they come to a decision that I could make complex budgeting decisions from that that's that's not complex that's something my children can do that better than I can do it now so where's where's the complexity my children help me with my accounts and my bills and my, because I don't understand it anymore but yet someone's come to the conclusion that I can make budgeting decisions myself on that one question, that seems a bit strange. Yeah. Yeah. To me, that, that was the one that really got me. Um, my husband was asked to work the change out from £5, but as I've told you, um, I've had to do so much because obviously I'm trying to make savings to, to keep the wheels on the pram, um, and there is no danger. He could have, for instance, cancelled one television provider to another television provider and deal with all the nonsense that I ended up getting two contracts from the new television provider because they had made such a mess of swapping over to, you know, and, then, and working out how, how much your house is worth plus all its contents because when you try to reinsure, that's what you need to do. And let's bear in mind as well, we were told our housing, our house insurance was withdrawn and it was withdrawn because um, a certain bank that was bailed out by uh, you and me decided they would no longer insure listed buildings. Now, it is an offence not to have buildings insurance if you live in a tenement. So, obviously, I was right on that. But trying to explain to people that you're in, you, you live in a listed building, no, I don't live in a castle, um, and trying to get the, the proper reinstatement value and cover for a house so you meet your legal obligations, it's actually very, very difficult and very time-consuming and certainly not something my husband could have taken on. And um, on the additional information, I mean, many of you have had additional information um, from consultants and uh, you know different reports. You feel that that just wasn't taken into account at all by the assessors in some cases. Not even to not even acknowledge that it was there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Well, thanks very much to you all for the, the information that you provided us with. As you can tell, we raised uh, a number of issues that we're going to have to take up with those who can uh, conduct the assessments, and that's the point of listening to you. So the information you give us informs us, gives us areas uh, for us to pursue, and that's what we'll do now. Um, so the, the information you provided today has been invaluable. Again, thank you very much on behalf of the committee um, for you know, putting yourselves into the, the public eye in order to help more people, um, because the more information we have, the more people we can help, um, and that's that's what we intend to do. So I can assure you that we will continue to look at how the rollout of PIP uh, impacts, <coughs> excuse me, on individual people, but in the the wider uh, population in general, uh, because we have to get this right. And at the moment, it doesn't sound as though it's an experience that people want to have uh, at a time when they need it the most, and that's not acceptable. Um, so your um, your contributions today have certainly helped us to, to take the issue forward, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'll suspend the meeting for a period of time to change witnesses for our second panel.
second panel this morning is uh, one individual uh, who's come uh, to give us uh, information and assistance, um, and that's Katie Ross, who's the Income Maximisation Advisor at Orkney CAB. And do you have a opening uh, statement to make, yep. Katie? And we'll just go to that then, and then we'll open up to the committee to ask questions, if we're okay with that. Yep. Okay, so Orkney Citizens <coughs> Advice Bureau is located in Kirkwell, which is the largest town on the Orkney mainland. Many residents of the islands are too elderly or disabled to travel to our offices and to help we offer telephone appointments, home visits and an outreach service to the outlying areas and islands. For those clients who use public transport, this can be via bus or ferry. Timetables for these are restricted and those in more rural areas may not manage to walk the several miles to the bus stop. Most ferry journeys are an hour to an hour and a half, although some are longer. If people have travelled to Kirkwell, they often have to do so for the day, which has both time and cost implications to the client. Due to time and travel constraints, we often have to get clients to post us their claim form in order for us to carry a telephone appointment to help them complete the application. We then post it back to them to approve and sign. The requirement to make telephone calls before being sent for um, the PIP paper form impacts on our workload, as we often visit clients for other reasons, identify that they need may be eligible for PIP and then have to arrange a repeat visit to complete the application. Under the DLA claim system, we were able to hold a stock of claim forms and take them with us on outreach and home visits. We have asked if it was possible to hold a stock of paper claim forms for PIP, as the DWP visiting officers do, but this request was declined. We often cannot visit the client again for several weeks throughout our work due to our workload and the travel time, and we ask the telephony advisors to add a note to the case to ensure a client is not penalised for returning the claim for a date. The travel time to the Outer Islands also affects the healthcare professionals who visit the clients to assess their claim, and this has an effect on the number of face-to-face -face assessments that can be undertaken in a day, this in turn increasing waiting times for other claimants. Since the introduction of PIP, we have assisted 70 clients to claim PIP. We currently have 32 active cases awaiting a decision notice. And when the process first changed over, we found that clients were waiting much longer than the recommended timescale for their claim to be fully assessed. An example of this is a client we assisted with an initial telephone call on the day the benefit was launched. Um, that was the 10th of June 2013. This telephone call was time consuming and the advisor was put on hold for over 20 minutes before getting through to an operator. After his paper form was submitted, our client contacted our office a further 10 times to request assistance in following up his claim. The case was eventually referred to our Member of Parliament, Alistair Carmichael, and yet it still took several months for this matter to be resolved. His claim was not fully assessed and benefit in payment until the 2nd of May 2014. We find that there doesn't appear to be any order to the scheduling of face-to-face -face assessments, with clients having their meeting with a healthcare professional before another client who submitted their claim often several months previous. At present, the longest outstanding claim we have on file for a client is from August 2014. We've previously raised with the DWP the issue of us submitting mandatory reconsiderations on behalf of our clients and us not being copied in on their response. This causes additional work for us as we chase up the client and or the DWP to try and find out the result, and this can potentially result in a late appeal. This is particularly true for clients who have mental health issues and have difficulty dealing with forms and paperwork. Um, with regards to mandatory reconsiderations, please also note per the attack, um, sorry, I think you sent that out separately, the descriptors, that should the client use a pillbox for their medication, they should be awarded a minimum of one point. <laughs> We've recently had to submit this on two mandatory reconsiderations due to clients who have not been awarded this, despite stating on the claim form that they do use a doset box. Unfortunately, no tribunals have been undertaken in Orkney for pet as yet. Our first hearing is due to be held on the 19th of May, and we're unable to, com to comment on the effect of this locally. The upcoming hearing is for a client who started the claim process in January 2014. 
Their appeal was submitted late due to the client's inpatient admission to Royal Cornhill Hospital. However, it is still taken six months for the hearing to be scheduled due to the irregularity of the panel visit in their island. The additional time taken to assess the claim has not only caused extra stress and anxiety to the client, who is receiving a lot of support from the social work and community mental health teams, but also has financial implications due to the potential loss of income over this time period. Lastly, PIP is designed to help clients with additional costs due to their care and mobility needs, such as increased heating bills, extra transport, transport costs due to limited mobility, or a need to help around for help around the home, etc. Many of our clients have advised us that they've got themselves into financial difficulties whilst they're waiting on a decision on their claim. This has resulted in referrals to our money advisors for helps with their debts and on occasion our in-court advisory service for clients who may be behind with the rent and under threat of eviction. We refer clients to the local food bank and have noted that the largest percentage of referrals for repeat packages are for clients who are in the process of claiming PIP. Whilst we accept that claimants who are awarded benefit have their payments backdated to the date they originally called for the claim form and they can use this to repay any debts incurred, this period of uncertainty, along with increasing debts, causes additional stress and anxiety for already vulnerable clients. We would also like to highlight that whilst claimants receive a backdate of their award, other linked benefits such as concessionary travel is not backdated. As already mentioned, travel can be costly. For example, a, a return bus journey can be up to ten pounds. Um, we'd also got some um, quotes from uh, claimants. Um, one client had mentioned that I'd taken some time to gather together reports from my specialist and GP for my face-to-face -face assessment. When the healthcare professional arrived, I tried to give them to her and she told me that she didn't need to see them and didn't even look at them as she'd be here all day if she did. I was made to feel very stupid and like she wasn't interested in me. Another client mentioned that I was very nervous about my meeting as I'd recently had a bipolar episode. I was feeling particularly on age. When the healthcare professional visited, I felt they acted very cold towards me and I didn't feel ease at all. And lastly, another client had mentioned that I was upset and crying during my assessment. I wasn't offered time to compose myself or take a break. I felt like I was being rushed and words were being put in my mouth. Um, I've also accompanied some of the clients to assessments. I've attended seven along with the claimants that have helped through the um, application form. Um, four different healthcare professionals um, attended those seven along with me and from my own observations there was only um, one healthcare professional that read back what the client had said and offered them the ch opportunity to change any of the details that they'd mentioned. One healthcare professional arrived late and rushed the assessment. I'd he already helped them complete the paper claim form and I felt that some of the questions were rushed and they didn't try to obtain examples or further information from my client. And there was only one healthcare professional that explained how the client can give feedback on the claim process and if they had any complaints or any comments to make, how they could do that. Okay. Thanks very much, Katie. Again, that's uh, given us some food for thought. Uh, just an initial question from myself. Um, I know the CABs talk to one another, um, and we've heard the evidence of this committee about the, the different problems being faced between um, CABs in rural areas in comparison to CABs in urban areas um, doesn't lessen the problems, it's just different problems. And I was just wondering if in your discussions with your colleagues in other uh, parts of the country, whether the problems you're experiencing are exclusive to your island communities or are they just a, a greater degree of problem uh, in comparison to others uh, or just what's what's the comparison like between you and other CBs basically? We generally would speak to us because we're neighbours for one or different words, so it would be the Shetland Citizens Advice Bureau and the Caithness one as well. Um, on occasion, when we speak to some of the more um, heavily more populated places, so to speak, so that'd be like Aberdeen and places, but certainly um, in our part of the country, it's quite common that. 
there's delays such as this and the issues that we're experiencing, their experience in the other island communities and in Caithness and Sutherland. Okay. And these face-to-face -face assessments, just how important are they? And do you think that they're, they're, they're valuable um, beyond just the, the application? For some of the <coughs> ones that I've gone to, I think they have been important. Um, not always, I don't feel, I sometimes feel that, um, for instance, the client that I'm taking to a tribunal in a couple of weeks, you know, they've been admitted to a mental health facility several times through Cornhill Hospital. You know, they've got the support network there and from reading the tribunal papers, there's been no um, additional input from her GP, there's no been requests from her social worker and I feel their input would be just as valuable to having done an assessment with her or for her coming along to the tribunal. Okay. Mm. Annabelle. Katie, hello, good afternoon. I was struck by a couple of things in, in your submission. In particular, you asked if you could hold a stock of claim forms, as you used to do with DLA, but that um, was declined. I mean, do you think that this scheme in the rollout, um, because it's very different to what has happened before, do you think DWP has got a strategy for island and remoter communities? No. <laughs> um, it certainly doesn't feel like that. And it's something that, you know, we find, and I'm sure in your own jobs you'll come across, <laughs> how living in Scotland things are different in different parts of the country but it does feel very much as if it has just been one size fits all um, as we said you know we some clients can't cope with the initial telephone call and if they can't get in to see us that means that we have to travel out to see them we generally will book a second appointment for two weeks time to, or three weeks time to allow to help complete the claim form with them but um, it does impact on our waiting list, whereas if we could go out and have the form with us, especially to um, some of the more remote islands, it can make a big difference. And it streamlines it a little bit for people as well, as I say, if they, they're struggling to cope. Aspects of the system, one is the system for the initial interview with the applicant, and the other is if it goes to appeal, <coughs> the um, appeal panel. Taking, first of all, the system for interview on the islands, I mean, how many um, healthcare professionals are there in Orkney to deal with the uh, main uh, island oh, and the surrounding islands? So it's visiting healthcare professionals that come up. Um, they carry out all the assessments via home visit, so that will impact so on the mainland to the islands. And, and yes. how often are they coming, Katie? Um, they've been coming up a bit more frequently lately. Um, it was the last quarter of um, last year was the first time that they'd visited us. Um, the last um, round of assessments that they do, they generally come up for a week at a time. Um, our clients just get a letter to say that their assessment will between, be between, say, 9 and 11, so they don't have a definite time for when it's going to take place either. Um, so they're waiting in all day, they're getting more and more anxious about this stranger that's coming into their house and what's going to happen. Um, the, but the last round when they came up, there was two that came up, but um, I only know that because I had two clients that morning that I was sitting in their assessment and I said, oh, I think I'm coming to the <coughs> next one with you, but she'd mentioned then that there was someone else up. And one of the appeals to which you referred, you said it took, I think, six months for an appeal panel to be constituted. Yes, yeah. And so that's the, the one that we have in, on the 19th. Um, we submitted the, I'm getting technical, but it's the SSC1 form, is the form that you submit to the Courts and Tribunal Service to request the tribunal. And that was submitted in November last year, and it's 19th of May before the hearing. And final question, convener. Um, <clears throat> we were listening to some earlier evidence, Katie, suggesting mm -hmm. that there may be a degree of inflexibility about the criteria and how people try to respond mm -hmm. to the cr criteria as designated. Um, 
and you've listed <coughs> experiences that you had with, with clients, um, three experiences. I mean, in an ideal world, w would you expect the form to be the basis of information to the um, healthcare professional and then expect the healthcare professional during the interview to flesh out what's on the form? Because I was looking, for example, convener, and I didn't realise this, but the DWP should take into account the fact that the effort of completing an activity can adversely affect your ability to repeat it or to undertake other activities, which is something we were covering in earlier evidence with the witnesses whom we saw. And yet, if you're trying to complete this form, it's not very clear how you make that known to the HCP. And we'll try and flesh out the forms as much as we can and put in examples for clients when we help them fill in the form because, as you say, they may be able to make a meal but can they do it safely and repeatedly or are they likely, as one of the ladies said this morning, her memory is affected so could she leave pans on the stove and is there a risk of fire, that kind of thing. So we do try and get as much information for that as we can when we're doing the forums but um, unfortunately you know, for the best will in the world, we can't help everyone fill in the forms, not everyone knows to come to us. It then means, Katie, that the interview is critical. It yeah. means that the interview really ought to be the clarification point for mm. what does the form actually mean in practice for the applicant. Mm. Yes, and I would certainly say from sitting in on the assessments, I, would, I get the impression that the person that's come up has seen the form so they know who they're going out to see. They would imagine get sent a pack that would have everything in it. But they tend to, rather than refer to what's already been answered, I've not yet heard one healthcare professional do that in the seven that I've sat in on. They'll just... It's as if they've started... The, it's the same questions in the same order, but it's as if they're asking it for the first time. Disconnect between what the applicant did with the form mm. and yeah. what the interview... And quite often our clients are waiting... But in most cases, they're waiting a minimum of six months and they could have a variable condition that the day that they filled it in with me, is that changed come their assessment? Or... Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You said that the DLE claim system allowed you to have a stock of claim forms and uh, my colleague asked that question. What was the reason given as to why you weren't allowed to have PIP forms? Um, I believe it's because they've said that it's under ATOS and it was ATOS that was designing it and also just because they're trying to streamline the payment was the other reason. It's, it's a forum. Yeah. So um, did you think that was a satisfactory No, answer? and we, we did try and push them on it, but we didn't really get anywhere, unfortunately. And it would certainly help the claim system yeah. if... You did have those, and you saved time for yourselves and people who are claiming. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, convener. My first question is on the pillbox point, uh, which you know is probably one of the most simplistic things, and yet it seems that in terms of some of the mandatory reconsiderations that you've done, that that point hasn't been awarded despite it being stated. How do you think they can get that wrong? I don't know. Um, I mean, obviously, if we're looking to reconsider a decision, it's not very often that that's the only thing that's going to get someone a benefit. There might be other reasons, but it's it's only been recently that it started to be flagged up. So I mean, I'm only really speculating, but it could be that maybe they've gotten a bit lax with it, or they've just taken that for granted. Um, the thing is, if they're getting that bit wrong, which is probably one of the most simple ones to mm. assess, it's either yes, folk are, mm. or no, they're not, it's on the form. If they're getting that bit wrong, is it not likely that they're maybe getting some other bits a bit yeah. skew with as well? Yeah. Um, I'd like to look at the case that you talked about uh, with the tribunal, which is due to take place on the 19th of this month. Um, and you've stated that um, it's six months since that uh, application first went in for the tribunal. Uh, and in the evidence, you say that the, the client has had uh, inpatient admission to Royal Cornhill Hospital, which is 
actually in my, my own patch. So I'm aware of the work that Cornhill does. Um, do you think that it's right that somebody that's had uh, inpatient uh, admission to Royal Cornhill has to face a tribunal? No. Um, um, that client as well, I mean, I can see, I've, in the few times that I meet with them, a lot of the time it's been through their support network, they've given authority for them because they just can't cope with the situation, can't... Um, can't cope with day to day a lot of the time, to be honest with you. And then having this, also, you know, um, it's definitely causing additional stress. It's the same. I mean, I'm not medically trained, but I can have that client sitting in front of me and know that you know there is difficulties there. And um, as I said, from looking at their papers, so there's not been any request for additional information at all. Um, that client, when they had their assessment at the house, her CPN had actually visited her to administer some medication during that appointment. And her CPN unfortunately couldn't stay, but she had mentioned that she's not coping with this assessment, but they still carried on through with it. Um, and the client obviously just found the whole experience just incredibly difficult. So, uh, I mean, the assessment itself having a huge adverse mm. impact on somebody who obviously has some severe mental health mm. problems. Yeah. Um, and the tribunal situation itself may well lead to some additional difficulties after mm. that. Yes. Um. Do you think that in scenarios like that, that um, medical advice should be sought and that some common sense, some logic should come into play and that folks should realise that they might be doing more harm mm. than good in terms of dealing with folks in this mm. manner? I would say so, yes. I mean, she has requested that her CPN accompanies um, us both to the tribunal as well. Um, I, some, I have my concerns about the client and the she can only sit for so long and then she has to just leave you know she does it with me because she can't cope with what's happening around her and we'll just say oh that's enough i have to go so that's why hopefully by having the cpn there they may allow her to speak on behalf of the client but again they try and get as much information from the individual themselves before allowing anyone else to comment on for them so Thank you very much, Katie. Okay, Christina, you wanted to comment on that? On, on um, uh, my colleague's point there, um, fortuitously this morning, um, Third Force News, we, we always send, they always send us the, the, news, the newspaper, um, have reported on a story of the Department of Work and Pensions being forced to disclose where there's been um, campaigners believe that people have, have died during the process different reasons, one of them suicide. And I just wonder if it's a story that you recognise? Um, not certainly through any of our claimants. I wouldn't say that you know, they've, they've gone ahead and have taken their own lives, but um, with that client that we've just been discussing, the most recent um, admission to Cornhill Hospital was among in about the same time as the decline of her benefit. Now, that's not to say that you know that her mental health would have been in a bad place anyway, but it does put additional pressure on people at a time when they're quite vulnerable already. Um, we have had um, raised queries as well, and so we've not come across it ourselves, but. If we're waiting six months plus for people to be awarded their benefit, if you're undergoing cancer treatment and you're coming towards the end of your treatment, you may not have been assessed before um, you know, you've know, you finished that and that's when you're needing the additional money. But what happens then? Do you get assessed from when you first applied or is it from that day? Um, we weren't able to get a clear response from that from the DWP. OK, thank you. Thank you. It's clear. Um, and then join. Thank you, Katie. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, on um, one of the points you made about um, the debt that people can incur while they're, they're waiting. Um, um, you did say that um, PIP was 
um, backdated to the date of application. Is that with interest? No. no. But presumably any debts been occurred to have interest on them yes. for most of the clients do. So, yeah. um, so it's um, you know a mounting problem from yeah. and, uh, up to six, six months, as you say, that could be considerable ones. Can you give us an idea of what other passported benefits PIP would give that aren't additionally paid to in that time scale? Um, if they aren't working and they're claiming PIP, they'll be on employment support allowance. Now, if they're awarded PIP and they live alone and they get the daily living component, which is essentially the care side of things, they'll get an additional allowance on their employment support allowance because there's a, a recognition that living alone, they may need to get someone to come in and help them. That won't get paid whilst they're waiting for their decision. Again, that should be backdated, but it's not happened in every sense. We've had to help some clients. Um, some clients as well will just see it as because they're getting six months plus, we're talking several thousand pounds, so they'll just think, oh, I've got everything that I'm entitled to and not query it further. So we do try and make sure that we're doing benefit checks for people. Um, it can also give them additional reduction to their council tax or additional housing benefit, depending on their household circumstances. That kind mm. of thing. And, and, and if, if a client's not aware that those are there, as you mm. said, they, they can just completely miss that they've yeah. been out of pocket and that whole time scale where that delays in place. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, Joy. Thank you very much. Convener. Um, yes, thank you. Um, we've been told um, in previous evidence that the DWP have changed their practices when it comes to terminal illness as a result of being lobbied by people like Macmillan and... Uh, and understand as well that you know people with not just cancer and but, um, MND were affected. Um, I just wonder, given your given your submission to do with delays, has it improved for people with terminal illness in the Orkney Islands, or are you still suffering difficulties there because of your geographical uh, challenges? Um, if a client is being diagnosed with having a, a terminal cancer diagnosis which is that they're expected to live less than six months then they, when they initially call to start the PIP claim process um, they do ask you know, can you make, do you need to make us aware of this um, and quite often their doctor will give them a form as well, a DS, DS 1500 and that's um, confirming that they've got a terminal diagnosis um, we've not come across too many clients with terminal diagnosis, but we have had clients with cancer diagnosis, and they'll just be filtered into the system as would someone with mobility. Not in any way. Right. <coughs> okay. Um, I also wanted to address um, in the second last paragraph of your submission, you talk about one particular client who has had to contact the office a further 10 times to request assistance. What was his experience of those 10 calls? Um, that client, as I say, he, we now ma try and manage people's expectations a little bit. It was new for us all when the PIP was introduced, but um, obviously he wasn't hearing anything, he wasn't getting any letters, um, needed support to try and phone and chase up his claims, so that's where... Um, he was contacting us. Um, it was also meaning that quite often he wasn't even able to get an appointment with us because quite often we need him with us to do the phone call um, to give authority for us to act on his behalf. So it was very much um, kind of additional stress again. I know I keep saying that, but it was very stressful, the whole thing for him. And very anxiety through the not knowing of what's happening as well additional worry. Uh, and you also say in that case that you eventually referred it to, to, to your MP, yes it still took several months for it to be resolved, um, did, did you think the, the MP made any difference, the involvement of the MP? Um, it can do, there, we try not to phone up and um, use the MP line too much, um, just in that we're aware of um, the workload that that everyone has and that you know it's clients that are waiting as long as what that one had done that we would do it so it can help by getting the MP's office on board but um, with that client 
as I say, it just felt like the whole introduction to Pip, although it had been anticipated, it felt once it came in that no one really knew what was happening with it within Atos, within the DWP, and for Alexa for ourselves and for our MP's office and clients to try and you know, work with that system when it was so ugly, wasn't it? Bond to the letter from the MP? <clears throat> they did eventually, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but they still... It was trying to push through to get the face-to-face -face assessment that caused the delays on that one. Right. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, one final yeah. short very supplementary short. from Annabelle. Thank you for that. Katie, I don't want to discuss the specific appeal to which you refer to in your submission, but if you are requested by a client to assist and the client has significant mental health issues, sufficiently significant that there could be genuine doubts about the ability of the client to have capacity to represent him or herself at the hearing. Is, is there a case for intervention by the medical profession in that event? Um, not that we're aware of. We can make special requests to the panel and this um, client that we're dealing with, we have already contacted the tribunal service to just explain the situation. They've asked that she comes along on the day, but then the judge can then um, at the hearing, if necessary, can allow us. We ha you know, <clears throat> I've had clients previously that if they haven't been able to attend, they've um, asked myself questions instead. This is for employment support allowance. Um, but the worry with that is that, you know, for me to talk on their behalf doesn't always get things across as much <coughs> as what the client can, because they, only they can express how they feel fully themselves um, and likewise that's why we're hoping that the CPN's evidence would be taken into account on the day as opposed to the client for that one. Right, mm. thank you. Well thanks very much Katie. Um, again that's added to uh, knowledge and information this morning which is really beneficial. If there's anything else that, that you think when you go back that you think the committee could use by way of information, please contact the clerks and let them know. And as things move forward, as you see things developing, uh, to be updated on, on your experiences would be beneficial to us. So feel free to keep in touch with us and uh, inform us as, as things move forward, and we'll try and use that information as best we can. But thanks very much for coming all that way and, and helping us out this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll suspend again for a minute or two. Uh, well. Um, agenda item two is our second item of business uh, and it's on women and welfare debate. The committee has agreed to undertake an inquiry, as we all know, into the impact of welfare reform on women and it's expected that the committee will report on its findings in June or July. So the option is available to us uh, if we wish to bid for a debate slot in the chamber in order to debate our findings and we just need agreement from the committee to pursue uh, a, a slot in the business uh, schedule to um, discuss our report probably from September onwards. Committee agreed with that? Yes. Okay. And agenda item three, the annual report. Uh, the annual report um, is for the period 11th of May 2014 to 10th of May 2015. Uh, members will know that the format and length of the committee's annual report is a standardised um, document, but we are entitled to comment on it or discuss it, but it's, it's pretty standard. Um, so if anybody's got any observations or points that they want to raise, Annabel. May I ask a question, Karina? I'm aware that my predecessor in the committee, I think, dissented from one of the reports and perhaps had dissenting comments in relation to another report. Um, 
would it simply be appropriate to refer to that in, in the report, not in detail, but merely to observe these were not unanimous reports. It would merely reflect the position expressed by my colleague. Yeah, I think that would, that would just continue with the, the process that was established by Alex. Um, so if you're uh, happy to do that, Annabelle, then that's, that yeah. can be taken. I think I can just put as a footnote. Heather, is it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. And everyone else happy with that? Okay, so I'll bring the meeting to a close uh, by pointing out that our next meeting is on the 19th of May when we expect to have our first oral evidence session as part of the Women and Welfare Inquiry and we'll also take further evidence on the mitigation of the bedroom tax. Okay, I'll close the meeting at that. Thank you. Thank you.